Hola y bienvenidos a esta reunión. Para acceder a la función de interpretación, haga clic en el icono de globo en la parte inferior de la ventana de Zoom y selecciona el idioma que desea. Para escuchar claramente el audio de interpretación, le recomendamos que también seleccione la opción para silenciar el audio original, que es la opción más baja en el menú después de hacer clic en el icono del globo. Xin chào và cảm ơn quý vị đã tham dự buổi họp ngày hôm nay. Để truy cập vào phần thông dịch của ứng dụng Zoom, xin nhấn vào biểu tượng hình quả địa cầu ở phía dưới của màn hình và chọn ngôn ngữ theo ý muốn của quý vị. Để nghe rõ lời phiên dịch, chúng tôi khuyến khích quý vị chọn chức năng tắt âm thanh góc nằm ở phía cuối trong phần tùy chọn của biểu tượng quả địa cầu. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. And I'd like to uh, call this meeting of the Sanitary Charter Commission of May 17th to order um, and ask the clerk to take the roll. Barbara Marshman. Here. Christina Johnson. Here. Elizabeth Monley. Here. Ellie Matsumura. Ellie. Enrico Callender. Here. Frank Maitsky. Here. Frederick Ferrer. Here. Garrick Percival. Here. George Sanchez. Here. Hui Tran. Here. Jeremy Bruce. Here. Jose Posadas. Here. Louis Barocio. Linda Lazat. Here. Lundiep. Magnolia Siegel. Maria Fuentes. Here. Sammy Robledo. Here. Sherry Segura. T. Tran. Veronica Amador. Yang Zhao. Here. You have a quorum. Thank you. Um, let's take a the first item of the agenda tonight is the consent calendar. Can I get a motion to approve the consent calendar, which includes our minutes? Any um, motion to approve the consent calendar, please? So moved. Thank you. Second. Commissioner Lazat. Second. Commissioner Monley. Uh, Clerk uh, Lazat. Clerk, take the roll, please. Barbara? Yes. Christina? Yes. Elizabeth? Yes. Enrico? Enrico Calendar? Frank Maitsky? Yes. Yes, for Enrico. Thank you. Garrick? Yes. George? Yes. We? Yes. Jeremy? Yes. Jose? Yes. Linda? Yes. Maria? Yes. Sammy? Yes. Young Zhao? Yes. Thank you. Oh, Ellie, it looks like Ellie's present now. Yes, thank you. Okay. Anyone thank else you. relate what I did? Um, all right. I see two hands up, Vice Chair um, Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I had a question about how um, the discussions were going to work today. We had a lot of important memos that came through on Friday, so I just wanted to know how that was going to be um, organized for us to discuss. Thank you. Sure. The, um, the agenda for tonight, we're starting with our guests from San Diego. Um, that's the first item of business and the new business. So um, we have a 60 minutes um, period of time for that. The rest of the meeting will be um, responding to 
the requests the commission had around the background on civic matters, um, their proposed subcommittees assignments and, and procedure, uh, and as well as the civic engagement procedure. So we have a lot of um, kind of report backs tonight from our consultant and we will look at, and we had a, I think three memos from commissioners addressing some part of that work. So we'll take those memos up as we get to that piece of the work. Um, and I, I hope we can uh, make good progress on all of them so that an, over our couple week break, uh, folks can get a lot of work done. Um, I hope and uh, Chair, if I just could, just to, to be very specific, there's two agendized items under old business tonight. The first is discussion of uh, uh, possible action on the work plan. And the second is update on the subcommittee process discussion of possible action. So we'll first we'll um, tackle the uh, proposed community engagement approach, get feedback on that. Hopefully again, like the chair said, so we can move forward. Um, quickly as possible. Uh, and then the second will be focused on the subcommittee process. There may be overlap, but we'll do our best. And uh, I would encourage, um, yeah, the, uh, the folks that shared the memos, I've read them all and um, hopefully other commissioners have as well, but we'll definitely include those as part of the discussion. Um, yes, including the last one that came in. Um, I read all, all of them as well, including the last one that came in, which was um, suggestions on one of the templates that um, Civic Matters has designed. Yeah, apologies on that one. It slipped through the cracks on Friday because uh, Megan Roche wasn't CC'd. So um, uh, Commissioners Barosio and Amador uh, and others, thank you for, for that. And uh, you all have it in your inbox. That's why I came today. It should have been there Friday. Apologies. And we'll be able to um, definitely respond to them tonight Eddie, as well because they're some good just feedback on that. Commissioner Fuentes. I just wanted to um, um, get assurance that, um, you know, last last time we met, I had a really concern about people not being not being allowed to speak. And um, I think if you could explain what is the expectation of our of our um, when it's our turn, you want us to be more concise, more brief. But how can we make sure that everybody gets a chance to speak when they have their hand up? Sure. I mean, there's a little bit of a balance here. Uh, as mentioned last time, I really am trying as a facilitator to make sure that the folks that haven't spoken have a chance to speak. That's just something that I've, I've tried to do for, for a long time. Um, and I really, to make sure that the entirety of this commission is, uh, th their voice is heard and brought to the fore into the discussion, that's something I'll continue to do. Um, I generally take a stack or a list of, of, of uh, order of hands as I see them. We'll go through it. Um, at some point, you know, we do need to, um, we, we spent close to, to four hours last time. So at some point we do need to move forward. Um, and, you know, the, the chair and I make decisions accordingly. Um, you know, I think the chair wants to talk a little bit uh, later about the, the length of this meeting and extending it if necessary to include more voices uh, and, and time for you all. Um, I, uh, you know, I, 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 I beg your apology as far as the, the last time and, and first calling your name and then needing to, to switch. Um, you know, it wasn't anything particular to you. It was just um, really getting us out of the door at our agreed upon um, nine o'clock time as, as soon or as soon as possible. Uh, as far as what we can do, um, like I said, uh, the chair is going to bring up some ideas as far as um, potentially extending this to a four hour meeting or setting that expectation because we seem to be trending that way. Uh, in addition, I would, uh, you know, really encourage you all to keep your comments concise um, and, you know, frame your questions as, as uh, succinctly as possible. Um, and also to not be, um, uh, to be additive, not repetitive. Um, you know, and this is, it's a balance. So, um, you know, I think that's probably what I have to share. And, you know, this is, again, uh, we're trying to, to hold space for, for 22 uh, people right now, soon again to be 23 people uh, during a three hour meeting plus presentations and procedural elements and public, uh, pub <laughs> public comment is, is difficult. So um, thank you uh, as, we, as we navigate this together. Um, All right, so now at this point, we'll have a uh, public hearing, uh, I'm sorry, public comment on our consent calendar. Any public uh, people wanting to speak to our consent calendar? Chair Beekman. Oh my gosh, hi, Blair Beekman here. Thank you so much for uh, allowing uh, 
public comment during consent calendar. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess uh, uh, from to a few reminders, I guess my, my purpose uh, for consent calendar time is to try to remind of uh, previous ideas from the previous meeting uh, that we can bring forward into this meeting. And uh, boy, this is it, a public comment to have to offer public comment at this time and the other concept of a, allowing public comment immediately after public presentations. Uh, that's actually what I was planning to work on at this time was how, how I think that actually may be more important, uh, most important at this time is, is to have a good procedural process for the meeting uh, is to allow public comment immediately after public presentations by presenters. And uh, hopefully you can work on that one as well. Uh, just thank you incredibly for, for allowing this time uh, for public comment. Uh, you know my, my love and belief of uh, trying to work towards uh, more open uh, democratic practices for a community, uh, for the future of a community. I feel it's the ideas of peace. I feel it's the ideas of sustainability and uh, it's really good stuff. And that, uh, to do that towards the future, it's not learning how we can incorporate more corporate practices basically. And uh, it's, it's, it's studying the basics of uh, the community and council addressing our city manager, I feel. And, uh, and, and with the mayor's help. <laughs> so thank you and uh, good luck in our meeting today. And uh, yeah. Thank you again for, for allowing public comment at this time. Roland. Thank you and good evening. So with regards to the uh, last comment, my personal preference is that the meeting be actually be conducted by the chair rather than, moder than the moderator. And I also believe that that should include making sure that members of the public stay on point and not be repetitive so that we can move this meeting along. Thank you. That was the final public speaker. Thank you. Let's now move to our new business, which is our guest tonight who's coming from San Diego. Um, the agenda does show that we will have the round of questions from commissioners after the speaker, and then we go to public comment. So the public can comment again concisely and on point. I, I love that comment, um, but on what commissioners have asked about. So you have the full array of wh where people are coming from. So I'll turn this over to Lawrence who will introduce our guest. Great, thank you, Chair. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome Amy Fawcett with us. Um, I'm just gonna pull up uh, uh, Amy's LinkedIn and read off uh, a long list of positions uh, which uh, give her some really incredible experience to address you all tonight about um, San Diego's path from a um, manager council to a mayor council form um, of, of, of governance. Uh, Amy was most recently the chief of staff for uh, the uh, former mayor of San Diego, Kevin Falconer. Uh, she was deputy chief of staff for former mayor Jerry Sanders, chief of staff for former council member Kevin Falconer, uh, council member Jim Mattifer, and uh, a council representative for San Diego city council member Judy McCarty. So uh, some of you um, wrote in and, and asked for a perspective of the mayor as well as council as far as the shift to uh, the, the, the mayor council form, and Amy can provide just that. So she's going to share some thoughts on what she's seen uh, on both sides of the fence, uh, what's worked. And, and how things are going in San Diego now since that, that change. And then we'll have plenty of time for questions from you all um, before we open it up to the public for public comment. Amy, thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me. Um, so I won't get into too much of, um, thank you, Lawrence, for that introduction. And thank you all for having me here today. Um, it's been a long journey <laughs> from council manager to uh, mayor council former government. When I started with as a community representative for former council member Judy McCarty back in 1996, it was council manager, former government. And then halfway be, uh, between, I was uh, chief of staff to council member Jim Medaffer uh, for eight years. And through the fourth year is when um, former mayor Dick Murphy uh, proposed doing, um, uh, bringing forward mayor council, former government. And my reaction as a chief of staff with, to a city council member was is that this is a power grab and this is a way to disenfranchise the council and just make it all about the mayor. And that was my initial reaction as well as my bosses. 
and um, it moved forward with a couple of, of uh, uh, I would say, compromises for the council. So, for example, a couple of things the council did not have prior to mayor, council, former government was an independent budget analyst. Independent budget analyst is her, well, her, because I'm saying Andrea. <laughs> She's been the first and still the IBA for the city council to do a fiscal and financial analysis of any propositions brought forward by, by the mayor or the council. And specifically the biggest authority the city council has is over the multi-billion dollar budget of the city of San Diego. And so she has, the IBA has a department of about seven people that what they do for, and they were, that department reports directly to the city council. So that the head, the independent budget analyst is hired and fired by the city council. So their job is to dive into the operational side from a financial standpoint and bring forward recommendations. And um, our experience has been that the independent budget analyst, from, I'm sorry, my experience from the mayor side of things has been um, that it has been really productive in, in bringing forward and helping frame um, the conversation from the city council side. Another very big thing that the city council got uh, when we transitioned to mayor council, former government was an, uh, an independent auditor. And the auditor reports, hires, fires, and is by the city council and reports to the city council. And there is a separate audit committee that is chaired by a city council member appointed by the council president of the council, as well as a second council member. And then I'm sorry, it's two to three um, outside people who have accounting and finance um, uh, background and experience. The uh, auditor has the ability as directed by the audit committee to go in and audit various functions of the city operations. So um, for example, um, how is street, street repaving, uh, resurfacing? What is that program and how is that working and could there be more efficiencies? Um, there's a fraud hotline um, that actually goes to the independent auditor and they go through and look through what type of complaints have come through and then they're, they're divvied up amongst the various uh, responsible parties, and then you have to report back to the, the auditor. Those were two very big things that the city council actually um, received from mayor, uh, mayor council former government. And if I go back to sharing with you all that I was opposed to the mayor council former government, just because mainly when you just looked at it as paper, again, it was, you know, all the power is shifting over to the mayor. Well, when you take a look at both branches of government, you actually, and you see what their levels of authority are, it, it is, it is uh, I find myself now being more of stronger mayor council form of government, especially with the size of the city of San Diego, which I do believe is similar um, to the city of San Jose. We're about 1.4 million um, uh, with a, a three plus, I think it's almost $4 billion uh, budget combined of general fund, enterprise funds, et cetera. And um, one of the things is, is when you have a city of this size, as is your size, you want to have the head, the CEO per se, of the operations and bureaucracy to actually be accountable to the voters. Um, under council manager form of government, when it's this large of a government, you will have the council manager, as you know, hired and fired by a majority of the city council in which the mayor is, is, is one vote. Um, the mayor is the chair of the, the city council, but also um, they are elected citywide, but still when it comes to their legislative powers, it is very similar to a city council member. Um, there's a couple of things that I learned um, I came to a lot of conclusion working as chief of staff to uh, former mayor Kevin Faulkner as well as deputy chief of staff to Jerry Sanders and council members is is that the division of powers is pretty is is pretty fair. 
Uh, what I found that the city council in San Diego do and spend a lot of time on is so much focus on what the mayor's powers are and how what they don't have and how do they take that and they spend a lot of energy on that. And what I, if I was working for the city council at the time, what I'd advise them to do is to start focusing and have a really good grasp of what their powers are that have been put into the charter. And if they focused on that and really took a look at that, the independent auditor, the independent budget analyst, land use authority, budget authority, um, there's, there's so much powers there that focusing on that and really using that to be a counterbalance to the mayor when it comes to governing the city. There's a couple of other things um, that we've learned that we should have done when we did the charter amendment, which was a vote of the people uh, towards mayor, council, former government. And uh, there are two flaws still uh, left. There's probably some more, but I will, I'll just go up with the two ones that are the most glaring. So under council manager, former government with the city of San Diego, the city attorney was elected citywide. So you, we only have two citywide elected officials, the mayor and the city attorney. That remained the same going forward into mayor, council, former government. So the only, uh, the, so the city attorney's department actually not only is the mayor's attorney, it's the operations and bureaucracy's attorney, it's the city council's attorney. Oh, and by the way, the city attorney is an elected political body in themselves. So when there are issues, so the problem is, is that the potential for the mix of politics of a citywide elected city attorney to be in place, all advising the mayor that could be a foe or a friend or the council, um, or they or the city attorney just in general has their own political agenda and election. So uh, one of the things that the uh, city attorney has for powers, they can determine whether general count outside council is necessary or the city council can vote to um, bring in outside counsel. Uh, the city attorney uh, in general, and I'm not referring to any particular city attorney because it's been across the four or five that I've worked with, um, is also is a concern of preserving their, their authority. And so um, they are not as quick to offer up outside counsel. So when you're looking through the charter changes, you may wanna focus on your discussion of the city attorney and what's their authority. Um, the city attorney, you may wanna be able to open up and allow the, the city council to maybe can have easier rules in which they can consult an outside council or the mayor when it comes to operational issues, a land use issue, um, a trip and fall uh, on a sidewalk, those type of things you may want to look at having it um, be the ability to have general counsel for the operation side. The other thing is, is that the division is civil um, and criminal. So one of the things that our city council tried doing in the last election cycle, but failed to get it on the ballot was taking away the uh, city attorney's uh, civil um, authority and just strictly from a uh, criminal authority. Uh, so um, misdemeanors, um, domestic violence, and, and those types of crimes that actually take place within the city's jurisdiction. Um, the other thing, um, I don't know if the city of San Jose has this, but it's the Civil Service Commission. And it was put into the charter in the 50s. And the Civil Service Commission is also an independent body. Um, that handles um, personnel, handles disputes, handles um, uh, whether, whether a, a step increase should be done for a certain class of employees. What we found is a complete uh, dysfunction, not dysfunction, but not a very collaborative coordination and it has nothing to do with people. Just, I wanna be very clear about that. It has to do with the structure. And the structure has personnel under an independent body. And then you have human resources under the operations side of the city. 
And those two are silos, unfortunately. And so personnel records for those that may have been disciplined, um, may have been dismissed for hiring, may not match the direction in which the human resources department acts. So if, if your uh, human rela- uh, excuse me, your civil service commission has personnel under them, I would definitely look at and have a discussion as to whether the the personnel part should be put into the human resources uh, part of of your operational side of things. Um, There's nothing, I don't know if any of you have employees or work in in any type of organization, but not being able to have um, complete uh, authority over your body of employees, your team, and you having it uh, a split amongst an independent body is a little confusing um, and can layer things down in even more bureaucracy than what's already there. Um, So I would say with that, um, you will also probably hear a lot of political public comments or uh, council comments or anybody who would comment and say, but yeah, what if, the mayor doesn't like a city council member or the city council member doesn't like the mayor under uh, mayor council form of government. Well, I will tell you, I worked for three council members under the council manager form of government and also split under mayor council form of government. And half of them were, one of them was very disliked by the mayor. The other two had a decent relationship. And I will tell you that the checks and balances that come with all bodies of uh, government, executive branch, legislative branch, and judicial branch does work um, when it's put together thoughtfully. Um, What I have come to learn over the years uh, under uh, mayor, council, former government is is, is that you do want to have somebody that is elected citywide and has authority and responsibility over the operations. It's far too easy, as I was saying earlier, for a large city like this, for the ca- the city manager to hide behind the council and hide within the bureaucracy and hide behind the mayor and the council as one body. Um, there is, there's also, um, with that being said, we also have in the charter that although the mayor appoints the chief operating officer, the chief financial officer, the police chief, the fire chief, those, P, those positions do have to get confirmed by the, a majority of the city council. So there is, there is that involvement that you would have um, where you do need to be responsible and responsive because you, you're not in it on your own. You're not there just because the mayor said so. Um, a lot of people would say, well, that's the mayor's chief or that's the mayor's COO. Well, I would say that the city council has authority to confirm those appointments by a majority. And that's, a, that's also important. Um, the other thing, one last thing, and, and if you'd like to um, go into Q&A Lawrence next, um, is, is that uh, we have a veto. So, um, so let's say the mayor presents uh, a policy and the city council um, votes, let's say we had nine, we have nine members and they voted five for. And the mayor decided, nope, I don't like that. I'm going to veto that. Well, the city council, the only way they can override the veto is with the, uh, with, is with the super majority. So that would be, you have to have six votes to override um, the veto. Also, under the budget, um, the mayor has line item veto authority. Um, so they can, but also it has to be sustained by a majority of the uh, super majority of the council. Those are all important things to look at. And I will, I will also say that when, when people get concerned about mayor council uh, form of government and losing control or losing any type of power by the city council, um, here's what I would say is that even though our mayor and council is nonpartisan, um, they are very publicly known <laughs> as to what party affiliation they have. And this last two years, uh, 2019 and 2020, when Mayor Faulkner, who is a known Republican, 
was mayor had a nine member council, six of which were, de are, were Democrats, two Republicans and one a former Republican gone declined to state. Um, his vetoes were always sustained. And it's about, because it was about collaboration, it was about listening, it was about working together on common goals, finding those common goals. So I leave that with you as a conclusion that things can, as with the balance and an understanding of authority and collaboration, um, things do work when it is, when it is balanced um, from an authority standpoint. And the culture, it takes a long time for a major organization. The city of San Diego has 11,000 employees. I'm not sure what San Jose has, but I think you guys are all very close to that is is that um, when you have that many employees it's really important to um, make sure that um, everybody is being heard and that the mayor can um, oversee the operations side so that you do have a direct line to your voters and your citizens and your residents of what they want out of their government and that is the best way of uh, i believe of making sure that the, the public is heard and then also through the city council. Great, thank you. I'm gonna start with the first question since there's no hands up, but I encourage them. Uh, and we talked about this a little bit, Amy, but have you seen any outcomes um, after the, the shift to mayor council that you could speak to, um, you know, as far as that cultural change or um, the accountability uh, to, uh, to the people as far as the, the government? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm going to use the example of homeless. <laughs> so homeless, as we all are across the country, especially in major cities, have experienced an outburst in the population of homeless. And uh, we were, Mayor Faulkner was no different than other uh, mayors and councils and elected leaders throughout the country that literally got caught with oh my gosh, it's getting out of control, what do we do? And so what I would say with that was, is that we were paralyzed in moving forward on homeless, creating bridge shelters and safe parking lots and storage facilities because everybody gets wrapped up and um, paralyzed by community support, right? Nobody wants a homeless services in their community. And so as the mayor, the CEO of the city, he did stand up and said, the buck stops with me. I am placing services in this neighborhood, in this neighborhood, and this neighborhood. And my commitment to you is that your neighborhood will be a lot cleaner and a lot safer than it ever was before these services came into place. Because we knew that if we didn't do it right, and we didn't stick to that commitment that we would find ourselves in a really bad position in getting that done. However, that wouldn't have been able to happen if you are having to go back and forth with a, with a city council that is uh, representatives of their communities and their districts, and they're supposed to be that specifically. Um, but when it comes to having to take a stand for the entire city, you want to be able to have the authority and the resources at the tips of your fingers in order to address issues that the city residents and voters are asking for. Great, thank you. Okay, I've got, um, let's see, Commissioners Marshman, Matsumura, and Seagull. Um, and then uh, Commissioner Meitsky. Commissioner, Mar Commissioner Marshman. And you're on mute. <laughs> I'm sorry. I I can't wait to see people in person. <laughs> no more mute and unmute. Yeah. Well, um, uh, just to follow up on mm -hmm. on uh, this, because I know uh, in Sacramento, Daryl Steinberg has also used the homeless as an example of, can you talk about some other things, maybe of a less extraordinary crisis nature that are being handled differently today so that we can get a sense of what what else could improve for a city our size. I also have a question about electing the city attorney, but I can hold that till later if you want. Sure, you know, the, the, um, the best program, I would say, department is infrastructure. 
um, uh, capital improvements, street resurfacing, um, sidewalks, uh, those basic infrastructure projects that get so jammed up with bureaucracy that it really took a strong uh, a mayor to come in as the that can actually had the authority to dive in to the operational side of the bureaucracy and say, show me how you make decisions relating to what streets get resurfaced, what materials, what's your RFP process. What um, uh, what's your undergrounding for the wires and the utilities? How do you determine all of that and how does that make sense? The other thing is you'll find um, a lot of, of, of CIP projects have money in them because they were put little amounts of money because that's placated to the community. Well, it was the mayor that was able to go in and really roll up his and her sleeves to actually see where's all this money is it really doing that community any good? Let's see what the most efficient way is to do infrastructure. And part of that was having to also work with the city council to make sure you had, we had a very good understanding of what those infrastructure priorities were for district. But I would say just in conclusion that the infrastructure capital improvements, making it more efficient, we called it, um, uh, fix the roads program or, or fix the fix it program, I think is what it was, <laughs> because it wasn't, it wasn't efficient in any way, shape or form. And I'm not sure that an appointed city manager and a mayor and a council manager from a government would have been able to, because in the city, the charter stated that mayor and council could, during council manager from a government could not direct anyone but the city manager. So that's an example of a less crisis that I think has been very beneficial in being able to roll out with the mayor, council, former government. Thank you. And, and Commissioner Marshall, we can come back to your question about the uh, attorney. Um, so I have Commissioners Matsumura, Siegel, Maitsky, Calendar. Uh, Commissioner Matsumura. Thank you. So um, you reference sort of complaints from city council about you know saying the mayor has all this power and and you know your responses look at the power that you have so how would you say that the those those political dynamics between council and mayor have and have not shifted because i i'm assuming that those same complaints didn't exist before under the council manager form of government oh no there was a whole other set of com complaints <laughs> Right. There's, there's actually, if, if, you're, if there's just no perfect way of doing it. But what I would say is, is that one of the examples, um, and this is this is kind of an issue that controversial uh, many cities are facing throughout the country, in which the council did have the authority to step in, and that was the discussions over defunding the police department. Um, in our recent fiscal budget, uh, the last fiscal budget, or no, I'm sorry, they're currently in. They are now going through uh, reviewing the budget. And one of the council members, the, the city council ended up adopting the mayor's budget, which actually increased the police department's budget. However, um, one of the council members was successful in incorporating in the, um, it's called the, the budget appropriation ordinance. It's the final law that dictates that budget. And I'm sorry if I'm over explaining, I, I don't know what people know um, about certain processes and procedures. Uh, they were able to get inserted into the ordinance um, a overseeing of expenditure of police overtime. So the budget, let's say the budget of overtime for police department, I'm just throwing out there six million. Well, they had to come back, the city, mayor's office, CFO, COO, and the police chief have to come back mid-year um, before expending any more of the, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, overtime. Um, that was an example of where the mayor said, no, we are moving forward and we're not defunding the police and this is what we're doing. But the city council had its ability and authority to say, okay, well then, but you need to come back and explain to us what you're doing and reporting and why this money is being spent the way it's being spent. Um, that would be an example of, of people complaining about well, the mayor controls the police department. Well, no, the council did have an opportunity and they took it 
to come in and put their stamp on something and it ended up being overall under very uh, challenging circumstances, especially relating, obviously, as you all know, relating to the police. Um, it was something that um, I would consider was a success and it was both branches um, having an understanding of what their authority was and it ended up working out. I, I don't know if I, hopefully I answered your question. <laughs> I guess a, a, a follow up just because in other presentations, you know, one pro that we've heard of strong mayor um, has been that if you're if you're having sort of political turmoil, having actually that shift in the balance of power can can cut through some of that. So, mm -hmm. you know, but I'm hearing that there's uh, some new sets of conflicts that uh, were perhaps generated, although you're saying that they were maybe traded off for previous other sets of conflicts. So just because sort of that perception of political differences, political turmoil, disagreement between mayor and council is, is part of what we ultimately have to weigh with form of mm -hmm. government. I'm, I'm wondering if you can share a little bit more about those political dynamics before and after. Uh, before council, with council manager and, and Mayor Council. Okay. So with uh, council manager, former government, your city manager typically is hired and fired by the city council and majority of the council. And so they're serving multiple masters um, when it comes to um, protecting their job. Um, and also from the charter perspective, if as I stated earlier, the mayor and council in the city of San Diego is not, was not allowed to direct staff, contact city staff or any of that. They had to go through the city manager. Under the mayor council form of government, the part that changes is, is, is that you now establish the dynamics of needing to have the, the success of everybody's uh, direct success is to constituent services, right? So street resurfacing, parks, libraries, you know, the city manager is, would be in, and I'm using these, this description more loosely, but in the context of it, the city manager is more concerned about what their five votes need. Although the mayor themselves and the mayor council form of government also needs to secure their votes. However, they also have a direct responsibility to those same voters and those same residents and citizens that, um, uh, need the services. So they are equally held responsible under mayor council form of government for the operations and bureaucracy providing the services to the council and the voters. And under council manager form of government, you have the city manager that can is going to have to hedge more um, by getting, you know, they, they have to, they're five, they're, however your large council, majority of the council members are responsible for that person's job. So that would be what I would say are the two different challenges that you have that come with it. Um, like I said, the fear of separating, you know, putting all this power into the mayor versus council manager where everybody is equal, it's not necessarily that way. Um, so if you have council manager, you're all equal, but the council, the city manager has all the authority An unelected person has all the authority. Under mayor council form of government, the leadership and the direct operation management of operations actually is accountable to the voters and the same residents and the same voters that the city council is. Okay, thank you. Um, Commissioner Siegel. Hi, and thank you so much for being here. Um, I wanted to ask about your Citizen Law Enforcement Review Board, um, its function, how did it form? Did it form in the context of your charter revisions? How many board members, how do you pick them and are they paid? Okay, well that, um, so we've had several um, Citizens Review Boards uh, prior to this recent one that was on the ballot in November 2020. Um, that is, is, is separate from the ones that were a mayor appointed council confirmed. Um, the new one, I can't, I can't answer your questions, I apologize, because uh, although the mayor did support it on the November 2020 ballot uh, to 
amend the charter to include a citizens review board of police practices, we were not there to establish it. So I can't tell you how, who's been appointed to it um, because that was left to the new mayor. So I do apologize for not having those details. Um, I will say that um, as, as a administration that I came from that is highly supportive of the police department, we were very supportive of the charter change to provide for an oversight, uh, an independent oversight board of the, of the police department and the police practices. Um, it's a common thing that has been done throughout the country. Um, and uh, if it does anything but open up communications, um, then it's a success. However, um, we did support it, but we weren't there to actually build it per se. But it's the citizens that are appointed to be on it? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's strictly citizens. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I, have, I have next coming up uh, Commissioners Meitsky, Calendar, Sanchez, uh, Johnson, and Monley. Uh, Commissioner Meitsky. Sorry, po point of order uh, to Lawrence. I've actually had my hand raised for a while. And I haven't oh, I'm sorry. I, I am not looking at the full, you're not on video. So, uh, okay, let's go to uh, Commissioner Meitsky and then uh, to Commissioner Tran. Apologies. No, thank you. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, it's so my understanding when this first happened, um, there was a significant brain drain with the city staff. As much as 90% of the staff, the higher level staff department heads on up, left the city between the time the vote happened and the first mayor took office. You know, one, is that accurate? And two, what is your experience in terms of keeping continuity of staff, the people who know the technical stuff and also the community as well? Yes, oh, I will tell you that there was a, a, a large, Exodus, I will say, when it transitioned from um, Mayor Dick Murphy, who brought forward the uh, charter change for strong mayor, who then he resigned, and then Mayor Jerry Sanders took over. Um, I wouldn't say it's strictly related to the transition to mayor, council, form of government. There was a lot of factors going on um, at the city. For example, um, the city was under an SEC investigation. There was lots of different, um, we were called Enron by the sea. So there was a lot of turmoil within the city that, that helped bring it towards mayor, council, former government, but also was contributing factors to a large exodus of employees leaving. Um, I would not say that transitioning solely from council manager to strong mayor, mayor, council, former government was the cause of it. Um, very good question relating to continuity. Um, so um, when, let me see how, how do I put this. So over the course of the terms, so when we just left, um, uh, the mayor, our COO had uh, left the city about two months before the mayor uh, Faulkner left office. Um, I, I res resumed being chief of staff as well as interim COO. And the new mayor came in um, and he brought in an interim COO who has experience working not only in council manager former governments, but also mayor council former governments. And th what they do is they really look at the top level of executive leadership. And I, I do have faith that um, if you have somebody that's really good, a good dire department director, a good assistant chief operating officer, a deputy chief operating officer, whatever your levels are, um, they're going to uh, have a place. And it's just, it's really challenging to actually drain the entire uh, brain trust of the uh, bureaucracy because it is so, it is so large. Um, I will say that a, a, a setback that I've seen relating to this recent transition is, is, is that we had worked so hard over the last four years to find a way to integrate the mayor's policy administration with the actual operations side and busting through those silos so that they feel like they're one team. Um, we got there, of course, always in the last like three, four months is when everything starts to move rather smoothly, right? And you learn all the lessons and you can go another four years, um, but that's not how it works. Um, and so the new mayor, I, I kind of get the sense um, that they may have kind of gone, took about five steps back 
um, a little bit with with uh, creating that same silo. Not as much, but you know, with anything, ten steps forward, five steps back, you're still ahead of the game. So um, hopefully that answers uh, your questions. Great, thank you, um, Commissioner Tran. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that in switching to the uh, the uh, mayor council form of government, that there was an opportunity for collaboration that uh, between um, the mayor and the council that didn't exist in in the council manager system. Uh, and if I'm misquoting uh, you, please correct me if I'm wrong here. I wanted to understand that better, right? And using the example of transportation projects um, in, San, in San Jose, we got uh, Measure T passed and. Um, and in that instance, uh, one of the ways that the funding there was distributed was to ensure right off the bat that um, it would be equally distributed or, or projects would be focused on equally in every district um, to make sure that there was no favoring one way or the other. Um, that was done under a council manager system. All right. Mm -hmm. um, we also have, uh, you know, and, and I definitely acknowledge that homelessness is a very contentious issue. Uh, and there definitely are, are um, challenges in trying to get that passed as well, uh, you know, in, in even in San Jose. Uh, but I'm actually trying to see here, uh, how did the collaborative relationship between the mayor and the council change um, such that, uh, you know, I guess you maybe believe that there's more collaboration now between the mayor and the council than there would have been before that where the mayor was a member of the council? Um, so when I was referring to um, collaboration under mayor council former government i wasn't referring to that there wasn't collaboration under council manager former government what my point was um just to, to clarify is is that the the perception of people was is that the mayor council former government by giving so much power to the mayor was going to take was going to uh, uh hurt collaboration that could otherwise be there so my point was is, is that mayor council form of government collaboration was not killed um, by mayor council form of government um, there's different ways to collaborate under the two different government uh, government but at the end of the day um, politics and government we can't get anything done for the voters and the citizens unless collaboration happens. It's just different when it comes to mayor council and council managers. So under council manager, the city council would spend their time, um, you know, collecting five votes, right? Out of, out of eight to make sure that they had a majority. Um, the mayor was integral as the chair of the board. However, when it came to making sure and monitoring and watching that the city manager actually went back to the employees and the operations and the bureaucracy to make sure it was done, uh, wasn't as short up as it is under mayor council form of government. Under mayor council form of government, you do have to get your five votes or six if you're trying to sustain your veto. Um, so collaboration has to still happen. Uh, between both both branches it's just in a different the, the the rules of the game are a little bit different are different and the authority in which everybody uh, has their role um i would say um is more uh, there's more uh i hate this term but i'm gonna say it anyways just for lack of better term there's more power under mayor council for both the mayor and council than it is under council manager former government um, when it comes to collaborating. Uh, However, I just but I just wanted to point out that th you can collaborate. Of course, you can collaborate under council manager. It just there's just different ways of going about it because the rules of the game are different. Okay, uh, and then Commissioner Trade, I'm gonna I'm gonna move us along because there's a, a few other folks that um, have been waiting for a while as well. Um, and I have uh, commissioners Calendar, Sanchez, John says Monley, and Fuentes. Commissioner Calendar. Good evening, Ms. Fawcett. Thank you for joining us. I definitely enjoy you being here. It was good to be able to listen to you. Two quick questions. Uh, first one is what major, this was put in place, what, in 2004, is that correct? Oh, yeah, it was It was put into place and then it had to get voted. It was about 2004, 2005. Okay. What major groups are opposing the mayor, council, form of government and saying that we don't like how this works and what major groups are supporting it, if you're aware? 
Um, yeah, so back, I would say the when they were transitioning from council man or the discussions began of transitioning council manager form of government to mayor council form of government, really came opposition came from the council members and the community, right? Because all of a sudden their council member, wait, what? Mm -hmm. We don't have as much authority anymore, which is not true. It's a perception. Um, and it was based on the community. Um, and then, uh, and the business community was the biggest supporter of mayor council form of government mm -hmm. going forward. Um, fast forward to today, uh, it's not really talked about, to be honest with you, uh, whether council manager, former government or mayor council, former government, it's not talked about anymore. It's actually talked about in the, in the form of well, what's your authority and what's our authority and how do we get some of your authority <laughs> and so it's, power? So it's generally accepted. And then, then I yes. want to go back to uh, something that you mentioned about and it's kind of more dealing with the CIP projects and the kind mm -hmm. of projects. So you had the homeless project where you said, it sounded like, I believe you said there were two facilities that were placed throughout the city and the mayor was able to do that. You also talked about CIP projects where the mayor can basically remove dollars from the CIP and so that means that ultimately they can put forward what projects are going to happen and not going to happen in certain areas of the city. How does the council involve themselves if they do not want the placement of that project or wants to move forward with another project? How, how is the council address that or how do they get engaged with that? Or because of the form of government, do they have no say? No, they do actually. They have to vote on the CIP budget. Okay. Um, so not only do they vote on the budget, which includes the dollars, as well as the projects in that, that community, um, or actually all in the infrastructure budget. Uh, so they have to vote on it. Um, and if they, so that's, so part of that is the mayor makes sure that there's, we have an understanding of what each of the priorities are in each of the districts and what each of the council members are, whether you're friends, you like them, you don't like them, you're the same party or not, we're all representing the same communities overall. So um, making sure that we understand what the needs of the community are, which should be reflected through the city council member itself. Um, so they have to vote on it. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the things that we did do is we would go, if a council member's like, I don't want this project anymore, I want this one, this is a big priority. Okay, well, we're not going to, we can't give you more money than what was already adopted. However, you know, we can ask the city staff to do kind of an audit of what available dollars and how far along certain CIP projects are so that those monies can get shifted. Now, at the end of the day, if the money does get shifted, it still is a city council vote. So the mayor doesn't have the authority to change any type of budgetary expenses, whether it's um, the number of, of positions within the city, whether it's a certain uh, CIP project, the mayor has to work within the corral established by the council of the budget they adopt every year, which is, that's why it's such a huge deal for the city council to dive in and spend so much time on the budget because that's where they set the framework for and the parameters for the mayor going forward from a spending perspective. Okay. Thank for you. at least that fiscal year. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Sanchez. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, thank you, Amy, for all the information that you brought us uh, sure. today. We had Detroit here a couple of weeks ago, but they're a little bit farther away. So you're, you're, you're <laughs> uh, a, a much closer proximity to us. Uh, but I was going to ask you when, when the change came, when the change came, uh, was there a, a mandate that you had to reach like 55% uh, to, to move forward with the change or how did that come about? And then the other, the other question uh, real quick was uh, in terms of the, who the mayor is, do you, uh, I guess you can't uh, uh, mandate an MBA or something of that nature, but the, is that encouraged of whoever is mayor uh, with this type of system? Thank you. Um, okay, so, no problem. So your, your first question um, is, is that how we changed from council manager to mayor, council, former government was through a change of our charter. The charter man requires any time you change the charter that it's a simple majority, 50 plus 1% of the voters um, have to approve the charter change. Um, so that's, so that's that part. Um, you can require, um, really any parameters that you want in criteria. 
Um, however, the higher education you go, the less people are available to run. Right. Um, so uh, I would, we don't have that. Uh, we don't even require a bachelor's degree um, for our electeds. I will say we don't even require a law degree for our city attorney. Wow. If you read between the lines of the city charter, yes. Right. <laughs> yeah. um, so that's that's a little thing that a uh, little secret that people haven't quite caught on to within our charter is, is that you don't have to actually be a lawyer to be the city attorney. Wow. Thank you. Yeah. So I would require that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Fair enough. Uh, Vice Chair Johnson. Hey, thank you, Ms. Fawcett, for joining us today and sharing your expertise. My question is, would you say this form of government is highly dependent on having a mayor that is collaborative and diplomatic in order to work? And could you foresee a problem, for example, if there was a mayor that didn't show the same agenda, agenda or priorities um, as the other council members? Yes, I, I would say that there, we did have a problem. Um, so Jerry Sanders was the first mayor council, mayor of mayor council from a government. And then we had a brief stint with somebody that was a dictator. He was only lasted in office for seven months before he had to resign. <laughs> and so then we went into uh, Kevin Faulkner was mayor for seven and a half years. And here's, here's what I would, my thoughts are. Yes, absolutely. If you could have battles between the mayor and council, um, Any time, whether it's council manager or mayor, council form of government, that doesn't change. It's all about the rules of the uh, the the rules of the road, right? As long as they're clear on what your authority is, what your authority is, whether it's under council manager form of government or whether it's under mayor, council form of government. The uh, what's great about our government in our countries, from local to state to federal. Is, is is that there's a balance, right? So no matter what your form is, you have a balance of power and authority. Um, everyone gets their say. Uh, council manager, former government, um, in, in my opinion, is um, it works for smaller cities. It's it literally having a nonprofit. If you look at it, a nonprofit board of directors that hires and fires the CEO versus uh, mayor and council of a large city is where you have a board of directors, um, but you also have um, the CEO that is elected also. Um, now, can the council turn on the mayor? Absolutely. Could the council make sure the mayor can't get anything done? Absolutely. That can happen also under council manager from a government as well. And my other question is, if a mayor can, if the mayor can hire, then who can do the firing? Um, so the mayor, uh, so he has under his, under his or her authority is the operations side. They're all called, uh, mayoral departments. Then you have non-mayoral departments, which is each of the city council offices, uh, the independent budget analyst, the, um, uh, city, the independent auditor, the ethics commission, city attorney. Those are called non-mayoral departments in which the mayor has no authority to hire or fire anybody in there. Uh, when it comes to the workforce, the operational side, um, the mayor has the authority to appoint uh, department directors, DCOOs, ACOO, um, COO, CFO, um, with the exception of the five that require council confirmation of the mayor's appointment. Uh, but keep in mind, though, we have six bargaining labor bargaining units that um, negotiate the terms in which someone would uh, an employee could be terminated. Uh, we also have uh, personnel, civil service commission. Uh, so there's a there's a regulations um, and processes and procedures that the mayor has to go through in order to terminate. I will say the mayor doesn't get too involved in. Um, I would say by just the nature of the job doesn't mean that they can't, but by the nature of the job, they don't really get below department director. Great, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Monley. Sorry, did you say Monley? Yes, please. Yes, okay, great. <laughs> so 
thank you so much for coming to uh, speak to us today, Ms. Fawcett. I, I have um, a quick question about the yep. public. The public is most, um, most, uh, most interested in how fast, how efficient a government can work for them, their city can work for them. And I'm wondering, under the mayor council form, have you seen a difference in um, aspirations to do better, uh, to do faster work um, and more efficient work within the departments once it leaves the council and goes to the workforce? Yes, absolutely. Because as uh, the mayor being the CEO of the city, um, of which the COO reports directly to the mayor. That is the, you couldn't get more closer in ensuring that what the council says actually gets implemented. So for example, we talk about the infrastructure improvement, how to make that more efficient. Well, not only are the constituents speaking to the city council members saying, or taxpayers, I want more efficient government, those same voters are speaking to the mayor. So when you have that, the mayor is equally as accountable to those citizens and taxpayers and voters of getting more efficient government as council is because they're on the front lines and they're down in the trenches, but so is the mayor. So that's, that's how I see that the mayor can actually jump in. Now under the council manager form of government, the city manager, oh, five votes told me to do that. And you know, I'll go do it. And, you know, it's a lot easier to have excuses from city manager as to how things can't happen because you don't have an elected official that actually can dive deep into the department, the processes, procedures, budgets, and take a look at it and say, you know what, you need to do things a little bit differently. So it's, it's really, really lifting up um, the, um, uh, lifting up the curtain um, when you have an elected official that can see deep down into the bureaucracy and operations. I mean, I will tell you, I was, I worked for the city council for about 14 years before I went to the um, mayor's office. And I thought I had learned everything I could possibly learn about the city. And I thought, oh, I'll just learn, you know, executive branch. Well, I got there, it was like a fire hose to the mouth. The amount of information and the amount of things that go on in the operations and the bureaucracy is, uh, absolutely amazing um, in good ways and bad ways <laughs> um, and you you really can't the citizens really don't have the their voices actually penetrate through the bureaucracy with council manager form of government likes it like it does with uh, mayor council form of government thank you right. thank mm -hmm. you uh, commissioner Fuentes Thank you. Um, welcome and thank you for thank joining you. us tonight. Uh, we really appreciate everything you're sharing with us. Um, my question has to do with, um, um, as you know, and probably San Diego might not be any different, in, in San Jose we have a huge gap in, um, in, in our city. Um, things are not equitable and mm -hmm. um, my question is, I mean, I appreciated your last answer. That that was very insightful how it might really work with a strong mayor in our city. Um, what are there safeguards in the city ch charter or, uh, well, let me just backtrack a second. Um, I have the understanding and impression that the, the form of government that we have really allows the whole city to have um, good representation and good opportunities to receive city resources because we have uh, city council members who are very connected with, with their district and advocate for, for the community that they represent. Um, but I'm interested in how this other form of government would work in terms of the accountability to make sure there is equity that resources are, are um, reaching the entire city. And in many cases, because of the inequities, that there are parts of our cities who will need more than, than other parts. So could you comment on that area, please? Yeah, yes, absolutely. Um, so 
one of the, the things that we did is we based, um, we have the same issues in the city of San Diego. Um, three of the, I would say, yeah, three of the nine districts, I'm trying to remember eight, four, um, and nine, uh, had the, are the most, um, have the, the most unequitable distribution of infrastructure uh, development impact fees, parks and libraries and things of that nature. Um, and really the reason for that is due to the equation that was adopted by the city council of how those funds from developer impact fees of housing and office complexes and for facility benefit assessments are being distributed. So for example, um, up until uh, about a year ago, and for years before that, the distribution of funds happened in a couple different ways. One, the city council, right, through the, its authority over the budget, whether it's council manager or mayor council form of government, they vote on the distribution of services and funds for capital projects. But also, the city council adopts the policy in which distribute how it discusses how to distribute those funds that come from developer impact fees and facility benefits assessment, which pays for parks, libraries, sidewalks, and streets. Previously, that equation only allowed the money that was generated from a development within one community to stay in that community. Um, we proposed, um, and it actually, believe it or not, it was uh, a little bit uh, controversial amongst some of the council members, is, is that it's not about which district the development happened, it's about those fees going into a pot of money in which is voted on by the city council and how that money is distributed to communities based on needs. We have one particular district that is all brand new development, has a facilities benefit assessment district. They have rec centers and libraries and everything that you can imagine because it's a brand new neighborhood. But if you think about it, that brand new neighborhood really doesn't need any additional money going into it because it got all of its infrastructure needs accounted for. So my, I would suggest that whatever, whether it's council manager or mayor council form of government, that you really take a look at what the policy is in distribution of developer impact fees, as well as facilities benefit assessment to see how that money is being distributed. And that can change by a policy ordinance or depending on what, how it's set up in your, in San Jose. Great. Thank you. So uh, we have questions from commissioners Dieppe, Percival and uh, Posadas, and then um, we'll probably need to move on, but uh, um, as always happy to, to field questions um, for the future. Uh, so commissioner Dieppe. We can't hear you. Looks like you're not muted, but not sure what's going on with your audio. Can anyone else hear him? No. No. Okay. <laughs> A lot of shaking of heads. <laughs> um, should we come back to you? We'll, we'll save time. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Percival. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, I'll happy to jump in. Well, uh, Commissioner Dieppe gets that gets that worked out. So thanks for the opportunity. Uh, really appreciate your uh, comments uh, tonight and appreciate your time. I wanted to kind of return to the to the issue of the veto. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's one of the, in my mind anyway, one of those more par powerful features of a mayor council form of government. Um, and you mentioned that San, San Diego, the mayor has not only veto power, but also line, you know, a version of a line item veto. And has, in your experience, have, have mayors used that in a way to uh, really sort of generate inequities that maybe were not there at the time that the policy was passed by council. So for example, you know, could the mayor strike provisions that were passed by a majority of the council in a particular district? Um, and then the council with the, it has an inability or unwillingness to sort of override that veto. Cause I think you mentioned that even though the council has the power to override a veto with a supermajority, it doesn't happen very often. So I'm curious about why that is. But but back to my first point was, or first question is, have there been instances where the council has 
pass certain projects uh, that the mayor have then has either reduced or eliminated outright from from the budgetary process. Um, I, I do think that that is entirely possible. And um, I will say my previous mayor, right before I became his chief of staff, did do one of the first line item vetoes on two council members. Um, I would say their, um, their office savings. So the council members each get to save their money from previous years, which is not likely that doesn't happen for other departments with their office city right so if you don't spend all your money um, as a city council member one fiscal year it gets carried over into a programmatic um, uh, fund for that city council member where they got um, that money was taken away however uh, the mayor turned around and actually uh, put it into projects in their district um, but did it for the, the community with and exited out the council member. So you, there's lots of different political games that, that you can play um, under both forms of government. But at the end of the day, what is most important is, is that if the, if the mayor does veto um, projects or vetoes something within the council member's district for whatever reason, um, it's very important that the mayor is going to have to do a risk assessment because they also are accountable to those same voters in that same community that is having their project cut. And um, that is not um, that is not as black and white as you would think when you're you're cutting projects because the the mayor even has community representatives that goes into the community um, as well as the council members. So, it's it is although it's likely i mean not likely it's doable um under the rules um however you know it's a very it's it's a very dangerous thing to start cutting budgets because you really 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 need to weigh the pros and cons because it will come back in some way um you know it it isn't it's all um I would say turnabout's fair play. Everybody has an equal playing ground at some point. Everything comes full circle. So it's those type of things that when elected officials start looking at those type of retaliatory um, uses of their, um, their side of the ledger, um, it, it's really important that it, you take, they take a look, hard look at what the repercussions are. Got it. Uh, Commissioner Dieppe, are you back with us? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Oh, nice. Ooh. Uh, hi, uh, thank you for coming. Um, you sure. spoke earlier about, or you alluded earlier to the alignment of the council intention with the city staff responding. Uh, and I just kind of want to mm -hmm. dig in a bit deeper on that. Could, could you kind of do an assessment of um, pros and cons between council with council manager uh, where the council speaks through the, the city manager and then the, the department heads and the, the st city staff, you know, uh, do their work diligently uh, versus any, you know, when the mayor is, is doing the hiring of department heads um, and he can, he or she can set the agenda of certain thing and have to go through the council for, for voting, but that the responsiveness and any efi efficiency gains um, through, through that process change. Um, that's a, uh... Gosh, and so let me just preface, in, in San Jose, we we have a priority setting session. So the council sits down once a year to say these are the top ten or twenty priorities. Um, so that's our process. Oh yeah, they the, the council. So the city council does do that. Um, they do set their priorities. The council president actually collects all the authorities and they create uh, excuse me their priorities, and they create their list of of things that they want to work on um, throughout the year. The uh, I will the difference with the council manager and the mayor council form of government is in the city of San Diego the council can't direct the mayor to do anything that's outside of their authority. Um, so their authority being the budget. Um, when it comes to restructuring departments um, and creating departments, they do need city the mayor does need city council approval. Um, land use. Um, they also have oversight with the independent budgets. Um, I just, it's hard to answer that question, but I will say there was an example 
of you were talking about a department director and um, hiring, firing, uh, and there was a department director that the city council was very upset with. More than likely, if a lot of if a majority of the council is upset with a department director, more than likely the mayor is upset themselves with the performance of that department director. Because when that person, as an extension of the mayor, goes to a city council meeting and makes a presentation on a project, on an issue, or on a policy, the council is going to hold them accountable, question and answer, uh, put them on the spot. And depending on how prepared they are, how they answer questions, how their decorum is, is a reflection on the mayor. So um, it's important that, um, they, that they conduct themselves in that manner. But like I said, um, a lot of the times I've seen that if there's a department director that the council is not happy with, usually the mayor is not happy with them either. Um, and so how it also I will get into, and I'm sorry if this is not answering your question, I'm kind of all over the place because it wasn't, it's not a clear black and white answer for, for your question, but for example, the COO, excuse me, the police chief and the fire chief, they are appointed by the mayor, they report to the mayor, but they're confirmed by the city council. The mayor has the authority to fire the police chief and the fire chief, but the police chief and fire chief can actually go to the city council and get five votes to overturn the mayor's firing. So depending on what your top priority positions are, you'll want to think about when you're, when you're having your discussions, is, is that what's important for the council to have be some type of backstop to decisions the mayor makes relating to hiring and firing appointments. Um, you know, the council can come forward and strip a budget of a department that the mayor is working on policies of which the council isn't supportive of. Um, we had that example with smart streetlights uh, about last year, the city entered into, oh yay, we're gonna have these smart cameras on the street lights and they're gonna be able to give us data on traffic and pedestrians to better look at engineering of traffic lights and, and things of that nature. Um, uh, and the uh, mayor brought it to the city council, city council adopted it, then it came very controversial because then it really wasn't of any benefit to capital projects and engineering, but now it became very beneficial to the police department in which they were, it became, they're monitoring people, they're, it's in different communities and it just got crazy blown up. Well, the mayor realized that uh, we weren't doing a good job explaining to the council the benefits of the smart street lights. We also were not, um, the, ca the council was going to strip the budget of that program, even though we felt that there was still benefits to the program. But because we knew it was going to get stripped away, we did it ourselves. Um, because we listened to the council. There must, there was something we weren't seeing um, and uh, we didn't have the ability to push it forward. So that is a program in which we really supported and the council didn't, and we had to back away from it. I don't know if all that answered your question. <laughs> That's good insight, thank you. <laughs> or little, pe little pieces in there probably, hopefully did. <laughs> yeah, thank you for, for that. And we're gonna go to our final question question for from Commissioner Posadas and if you have additional questions I see you Commissioner Tran please send my way and uh, I'll, I'll coordinate with Amy uh, to see if we can yeah, get I'm this happy to you. ask answer any questions that you all have after the fact I know that even I come up with things after um, and I'm like darn I should have asked that question so I'm happy to answer through Lawrence any other questions you have thanks thank you um, so so very soon we as a commission are going to embark on engaging our community and gathering um, their feedback on the proposed changes to the charter. And you touched a little bit about how the mayor and the city council interact with the community. Um, so my question is, have you seen a change in community engagement from both forms of government? And what in general would you say are best practices for uh, reaching out and soliciting input from the, uh, the greater community? Um, there hasn't really been a huge change in the community engagement between the mayor and council, or the mayor and council under council manager or mayor council form of government. What I have seen um, and we've implemented in the mayor's office 
under council manager form of government, the mayor had community representatives that also went out to all the districts and the communities, but also kept really close with the city council members. That has stayed the same under mayor council form of government. I will say the difference is, is that for those community representatives that work with the council member and or go out into the community directly at the mayor's uh, direction are able to quicker than usual uh, get constituent concerns resolved because that mayor uh, community rep has the authority to go to the director of water department um, and say, hey, this person has ha had their water shut off or they're having a hard time getting their bill taken care of. Um, there's a pothole here that hasn't been fixed. You know, any one of those things from big to small, they have the authority to do that. The other thing is, is, is that um, with the, the mayor's council community representatives being able to work and direct city employees, that is a really great collaboration. Uh, more times than not, the council rep for the mayor works directly with the council office and they collaborate and come up with lists that need to be done. And so I wouldn't say that it has changed structurally um, on how people collaborate uh, or how the mayor and the council work with the community. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, and on that question, I'm going to say on behalf of the commission, thank you to Ms. Thank Buster. you for having me. Really appreciate you being your safe flight back to San Diego and enjoy <laughs> the weather of our southern uh, part of our state. Um, and if there's other questions, I know Commissioner Marshman had a question about the election of the city attorney. Um, any other questions, Commissioner Tran, if you have questions, please send those to Lawrence and we can we can forward those down. Um, but again, our thanks to you for your, your support. Thank you. Really appreciate your thoughtfulness and your time. Um, and we wish you the best. I'm Same the to you and good, good luck with this. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, at this time, we'll have public uh, comment on this item. First speaker. Call, call in user one. Call in user one. Yeah, uh, I got a question. How does San Diego seem to run everything so well and this city is run like a disaster? I mean, they can't even keep a fountain running at the Rose Garden. What, how are you guys able to stretch your, your budgets and everything? I mean, our our city council and mayor are very, very left wing. Seems as if San Diego is a little bit more on the right or the center. What do you think the reasons why San Jose is run so poorly, and why they have to have somebody from another city come in and give them guidance? Do you have any thoughts on why this city is run so bad? I'd like to know. I know why, but uh, you know, quite frankly, the city manager should fire should fire Sam Licardo, and Sam Licardo should fire the city manager. And that would be perfect, right? That would be perfect. And the rest of the city council just, you know, every, everyone is, uh, it's like the student union over there. They're trying to finish a term paper uh, about, about something that's ridiculous. And that's why this city is run so terrible. So they think they're writing a term paper and experimenting with ideas that have failed time and time again over the last couple hundred years. Uh, so I don't know. I like, I like to know what, what you think about this city. Be honest, because I think you, I think you know. Let me know. Thank you. Next speaker. Blair Beekman. Hi. Thank you. Blair Beekman here. Um, that was really interesting. Um, it was nice to get uh, a different perspective uh, that I haven't heard before. Obviously, I'm, I'm coming into this process uh, a bit shallow and not so knowledgeable, but it's nice to learn. And uh, thank you. Uh, for this person uh, today, um, I <clears throat> excuse me. I I learned uh, more in depth about uh, the technology issues in San Diego, that actually brought out its public to really question uh, the future of technology and surveillance technology in their community. It was a really interesting time, and it was nice to hear her explain that. Uh, um, you know, I'm still a real strong believer in. Um, 
how this, the strong mayor ideas will relate to the city charter process itself and how the mayor can be given, how can the city charter be written? So, you know, some obvious points, the mayor that we all already know the mayor should be able to do, how can that take place? Uh, the person today offered a bit of subtlety how to do that. And I figure a real good guideline and guardrail is once a mayor starts talking about his corporate power and his, and his practices with large developers and large corporations and real estate, and that should be an issue of strong mayor, that's when we put on the brakes. And that's when we say, no, we're not gonna go in that direction. So, uh, you know, if, how it works pertains to, you know, the community and, 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 and good decision-making, good luck in your efforts on this issue. I, I really think that can be a good direction how we talk about this issue and what I think we're, how we're talking about it. So let's keep up those good efforts and, and thank you. And uh, thanks for this item. Thank you, next speaker. Roland. Thank you. And I also really, um, you know, appreciated uh, the presentation uh, and the discussion. And, and there really, in my mind, there is not a lot not to like about the uh, um, the form of our government in San Diego. But I'm going to make one exception. It's the power of veto. I come from Europe. And to me, the power of veto is a form of dictatorship. It's got nothing to democracy. And as far as I'm concerned, the power of veto does not belong in our city's charter. Thank you. Thank you, next speaker. Roland was the last speaker. Thank you. All right, um, let's move on. Um, we have a lot to cover tonight for our own infrastructure. So I wanna get into that um, forthwith. Um, so the first report is the report from the chair. Um, and one of my um, concerns is trying to move us through a three hour meeting that looks like it's getting longer. So I'm wondering if um, we move to a 5.30 start or a five o'clock start. Um, I'm still gonna keep trying to keep us down to three hours, but it's just not happening. So I'm wondering if we could start at 5.30 um, and the next set of meetings that we start to look at when we're getting recommendations we're gonna get recommendations, have a lot of discussion, a lot of public input. And so I have a feeling that those meetings are not gonna be shorter um, and we'll have less control because we'll have more public engagement in terms of controlling the timing. So that's my recommendation is that we start earlier so that um, we'll get us at least another half hour of time and that we'll continue to try to be as efficient and diligent as we can. Any thoughts, questions? Okay, seeing none, I'm gonna keep moving on, <laughs> thank you. Um, our next item is a report from the clerk. I have nothing to report. Okay, um, did, um, Lawrence, is the city attorney gonna speak at this point? Well, I think um, it might be helpful to have the city attorney uh, speak during the subcommittee process discussion uh, regarding some of the, the Brown Act concerns. Um, okay. uh, Mark, if that's okay with you. That's great. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. All, right. All right. Now let's move to our report from our consultant who's going to talk about our community engagement approach. Um, and I think the other piece to this is that um, at some point, I think we also want to make sure that Lawrence, you cover your uh, background, the Civic, and, the Civic Matters background, which was a document that was also sent out to you. Oh, sure. I don't yeah. know if there's any questions on that, but I hope everyone had a chance to read it and talk about uh, or read about the, the background and depth of background of our consultants firm. Um, and so if we do have questions on that in a minute, that'd be great. But let's walk through the community engagement. Um, okay, is yeah. There, is there any questions about Civic Makers background? I can just really briefly, you know, highlight for, for folks that um, I haven't talked much about our work, but um, I have a background in the public sector. I've done outreach and engagement for city and county of San Francisco and Alameda County. Um, my firm at this point, uh, 
specializes in doing community engagement. Um, we also specialize in partnering with, with CBOs that are based in the communities that we're partnering with to uh, develop authentic and culturally appropriate outreach materials, engagement process, um, and the uh, engagement process that as much as possible informed by those very participants. Um, so I, I shared a document with you that's a little bit about our firm, um, our team, and a couple qualifications. I won't go into details, but just share that uh, one of those qualifications was supporting um, the city manager's office in San Jose about uh, public input on developing some digital privacy principles. We've also worked with the Santa Clara Housing uh, County Housing Authority most recently on a, um, a couple development projects they've wanted to do public engagement for. We've worked with the Napa Valley Transportation Authority recently. Um, we have done a pretty extensive program with the city and county of San Francisco Digital Services, which has been um, exclusively partnering with CBOs to um, give them stipends to help uh, recruit uh, residents uh, from across the city and in different uh, districts and neighborhoods to give feedback on city services. Uh, and we've also worked most recently or, or recently with the city of Hayward on uh, community engagement to inform their citywide strategic plan. As a couple projects, um, you know, I, I did want to just hopefully address some of the concerns that were that came up last commission meeting. Um, you know, our intention here is I hope you'll see when we get into the um, um, the community engagement approach is to be the the coordinator um, and to really leverage the the relationships and the the lived experience of the CBOs in Hens in San Jose to to do the the bulk of the uh, of the work here. Um, any questions uh, before I jump in? Yeah, Commissioner Fuentes. Thank you. Um, thank you for the background information and for your explanation. So I'm interested in you know something very, I guess it's very specific. Mm -hmm. um, when you, um, um, I understand how you, you bring in um, community organizations and, and so forth, um, but actually, when you have the session, so let's just imagine we're, we're um, having a session in District 7, Franklin McKinley area. Um, who will be leading those sessions? Because a lot of it in terms of the openness and comfort and, and uh, engagement of participants is the rapport between whoever is leading the session as well as the, uh, well, more than anything, whoever is leading the, the session and how comfortable they feel, because it's going to be, sure. you know. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, I think that's a good segue into the community engagement approach. And, and just to be clear, you know, what this plan is intending to do uh, is to um, work with community benefit organizations, I think primarily to do two things, really help us understand how to talk about this conversation about city charters, about the context of this process in San Jose, to talk about it in a way that resonates and can be understood by the various um, priority populations we want to be, that you want to be um, hearing from uh, in this process. Uh, so making sure that we're, we're benefiting from developing messaging framework and then translating that into the right outreach materials to, to like I said, to, to properly resonate with and engage uh, those populations. The, the second piece is to, uh, to work with those community benefit organizations to uh, essentially do the outreach to their communities, talk to those communities about this process, and uh, recruit members uh, of their uh, communities, populations, networks to attend a public hearing. So what we're really trying to do is drive the, the public feedback to public hearings that have been um, earmarked for those three buckets um, rather than have multiple focus groups. And, and that's a, a couple of reasons. One is that, um, you know, the budget to do um, multiple focus groups for multiple um, CBOs while also working with them to um, promote the, the public hearings, there was additional funds for, um, allocated, but you know, it, it gets expensive after a while. And the other is to leverage the, the support of the city clerk's office and doing the translation and interpretation real time. Um, the other is to make sure that all the commissioners can be present to um, uh, hear directly from the public. Um, the, the, if we're, then there's also the potential, and this is where some conversations with the city attorney come up. Um, if we, um, there are questions about what 
public engagement looks like, what public conversation looks like for um, meetings that are non-Brown acted um, uh, as far as focus groups to solicit input for, for this commission. So uh, again, to, to be clear, the, um, the, the, the proposal here is to leverage the CBOs to drive attendance for, um, to, to educate, um, develop the right materials to educate and drive attendance for the public hearing so that you all can um, hear directly from public participants um, how, the, how those are facilitated, who facilitates those. Um, you know, I, I, I would love suggestions about that. Um, and that's, um, uh, we do have to start the process for planning for that public hearing um, that we have proposed in the work plan uh, as far as the 30 day notice that the, um, the city clerk's office uh, requests. Um, but uh, open to, to thoughts about, um, you know, if the chair could do it, there could be um, other folks that are involved with the presentations. Um, but I hope that answers your question. I'm, so not sure. I'm, I'm not sorry, sure. you, you said you would be open to um, ideas about who would facilitate the sessions? And well, who would, who would um, present at the public hearing? Uh, chair, do you have thoughts? We haven't ex explicitly talked about what we have the public hearing, like who would do the presentation from the commission? So I would answer your question. Uh, your question a little bit different, Commissioner uh, Fuentes, I would say it would be the CBO facilitating that conversation in the community um, and not civic makers or the commission itself. It would be those CBOs. Those CBOs would then organize that message to come back to the full commission in the public hearings. So what I'd like us to do is ask, um, is to go through the, um, the suggestions that civic makers is making and then we can ask questions about it. So I, but I, but I, my answer to you is it would be the CBOs. Okay, yeah, and, and the point I was trying to make is that the, we're not proposing facilitated focus groups um, for the CBOs, but let me go through the approach here. Um, I, I, there's a lot of detail here, so I, I have some objectives and uh, outlined, probably worthwhile uh, sharing them. Um, we want to understand the community needs, preferences, and concerns related to improving accountability, representation, and inclusion at City Hall. Uh, we want to educate the community on the role of the city charter and the review process to elicit meaningful input from the public. We want to earn resident trust in the commission's process and commitment to listening and representing the community interests. And we want to place special focus on reaching hard to reach vulnerable and historically marginalized group. Um, uh, Again, you know, the, the point of this plan is to educate San Jose residents and the, about the charter review process and the commission and encourage, encourage publication, public participation via public hearings. Um, emails to the city charter uh, review commission would be welcome as well. Uh, this, this is outlined more in the work plan, but um, really talking about four, potentially five public hearings. Um, one, which we would like to do as soon as possible, and we have proposed doing it on the, during the regular commission time on Monday, June 28th, but uh, basically presenting the results of the commission study phase um, and um, asking the public to share um, their thoughts on the issues and challenges they face that they think the, that you all um, can address via your deliberations. Um, as a way to, and this is where it loops back to the subcommittee process, but really I, I see this as, as a way to um, really finalize the, the list of topics for all the subcommittees, uh, including the accountability representation um, and inclusion um, set of subcommittees. Um, so that would be the, the first public hearing and then having public hearings um, on each of the, the major categories, timing of elections, governance and balance of power. and um, Again, one on accountability, representation, and inclusion at City Hall. And then um, we have an optional one here on the feedback of the draft majority and minority reports, um, you know, as we, as you wrap up your deliberations. We have some thinking here about the priority populations, um, a demographic uh, overview of San Jose and um, the various groups um, that, uh, that live and reside in, in San Jose. Um, Really what we're trying to just lay out for, for all of us is to get on the same page about who really is in San Jose and, and who do we want to prioritize um, in this community engagement effort. And that priority populations here that we, we lay out, um, recognizing that low-income households often face multiple barriers to public participation, um, you know, we'll pursue a concerted effort, uh, engagement effort to reach low and very low-income households. Um, we're proposing, um, uh, 
specific outreach to the following language communities, Spanish, Vietnamese, and Chinese, potentially Filipino. We want to talk to the city clerk's office about that, um, as these are the, the, the majority um, uh, non-English speaking groups in San Jose. Um, and also um, looking at these districts in particular as areas to focus um, to, to uh, basically find and, and, and reach these, these populations. Uh, the outreach engagement strategy is essentially twofold. The easier reach populations, the folks that have already heard about the commission or that are more plugged into, um, you might call them your, your regular um, uh, outreach channels um, would be what we're just terming easier to reach populations. Um, and so uh, folks that have access to, to the internet and digital devices that uh, may already be attending public hearings, but just haven't realized what the Charter Review Commission is. Um, that will be the, the broad-based general um, outreach. The, the, the bulk of this is gonna be, again, for the hard to reach populations um, and um, that focus, deep engagement and partnership with the community-based benefit organi uh, community -based organizations. Um, so um, talking about sort of the, um, again, this is sort of a, the mapping out the priority populations and thinking about the barriers that they can face. So think, using these barriers as a way to not only structure the, the outreach and engagement, but also to, to essentially double check our work um, to make sure that we are uh, engaging um, in a way that, that we're meeting people where they're at and, and um, we're reducing the barriers as much as possible whether those are language access, um, sort of historically difficult to reach or, or marginalization uh, by district or geography, um, uh, digital barriers, um, as well as uh, ability barriers. And uh, all of this really, you know, we're gonna put by the, the community benefit uh, CBO partners, community-based organization partners, um, to really help us understand how exactly to do that. Um, what I've laid out here is a, a process to select the, the right community partners. Um, the process that we're proposing is uh, finalizing the selection criteria, and developing an application or an interest form that we would share ASAP, hopefully um, this week if possible. Uh, the criteria are below, which I'll walk through in a minute. Um, but really uh, getting that ready to announce an open call for submissions and share applications uh, from, uh, sh share the application forms with CBOs. We have a list of, of folks that, that we work with in the past in San Jose. You all have incredible connections as uh, referenced in the appendix of this document. So we really ask you all to, to share that interest form when it's ready, hopefully later this week to make sure that we have the, 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 the broadest reach and hear from the most CBOs uh, as we can. Um, and um, in the meantime, uh, civic makers will draft a memora memorandum of understanding, including a scope of work and payment terms uh, between us and the CBOs. Uh, the chair, uh, vice chair and, and myself would evaluate the applications that come in against the criteria and um, essentially make final selections and sign MOUs and get working as quickly as possible on doing the uh, messaging uh, framework for how to talk about the commission uh, and its work and then city charter uh, and its deliberations, uh, as well as preparing for that first public hearing. Uh, that public hearing is uh, only six weeks away, so we need to be moving as quickly as possible. Um, the, this is probably something that we would bring to the, to the full commission. However, because of the Memorial Day holiday uh, uh, next two Mondays, the, the May 31st, the commission has a break. So we just can't afford to wait that long to really uh, select our CBO partners. So Vice Chair Johnson uh, and the chair and I have talked about um, uh, doing that review and selection process, uh, hopefully with, with your uh, blessing based on these criteria that they have uh, ample experience working with at least one priority population, uh, demonstrated ability to conduct culturally appropriate outreach and engagement, um, ability to at least reach 100 members of at least one priority population, um, uh, five plus years uh, conducting outreach with a specific priority population, uh, has availability and necessary staff capacity for this work, brings an equity lens to this work, um, and brings experience working with communities to overcome barriers to public participation. Uh, and again, thinking about those, those uh, barriers for the priority populations, we have some sub criteria here. Um, you know, as much as possible, we'd want to make sure that we select at least one organization that meets some of these sub criteria so, criteria so that we're um, uh, getting the right coverage that we need. Uh, 
the roles and responsibilities of the CBO consult on the development of plain language messaging that uh, clearly and effectively communicates the commission's purpose, key questions, and outreach asks. Um, they would develop their own equity-centered outreach plan, plan with support from, from civic makers and informed by uh, the Somos Mayfair engagement philosophy that, that we've heard about and, and talked about. Uh, but again, this would be something that they would be responsible for, would be part of their scope of work, and um, we would uh, work with them to make sure that it, that it, that it seal, feels appropriate to, to, to meet the objectives that uh, you all have, have set out. But this is Again, making sure that we're not doing, they're doing um, what they do best uh, and we're not um, um, unduly influencing their work. Um, they would then, with that approved uh, outreach plan, conduct the outreach to the priority populations to raise awareness about the Charter Review Commission upcoming hearings, collect contact information of those interested in attending hearings, and provide a reminder to all contacts one week and one day before each hearing date, either by phone call, text message, WhatsApp, WeChat, email, or other channel, um, depending on the community group preferences. Again, we really want the CBOs to tell us um, what the best way to engage with their populations are. And so if they tell us that um, uh, a, uh, any of these channels won't work, the best thing is going to be to show up at this particular place uh, a week and a day before the, the next public hearing, that's what we would work with them to do. Um, provide support as necessary to bridge digital divide barriers to hearings and also provide a report back to us um, with the outreach conducted, the number and demographics of contacts collected and number and method of reminders so that we have some metrics about what's working and can make um, uh, tweaks uh, to the outreach plans as necessary in flight so that we're, um, again, making sure that we get the coverage and, and outcomes we want. The overall phases of this engagement approach are the planning and partnerships phase. Um, now until the beginning of June, where we would identify and engage CBO partners and finalize this engagement approach in the timeline with CBO input. The messaging and collateral development phase, which would happen as soon as we have the CBOs on board to develop that messaging that I've talked about, um, identify and revise critical documents that provide the commission background. That might be some version of the Charter 101 um, chart or presentation, um, and then uh, to provide that historical context, and then uh, additional key collateral pieces for outreach and engagement to promote public hearings uh, and translating all those documents and collateral uh, in collaboration with the city clerk's office, and then getting out there and doing the outreach and engagements um, around public hearings um, in an ongoing way. Um, and also to prevent, potentially prevent feedback about the final reports to council if we uh, feel like we want um, any of the community we, that you've heard from to, to be uh, present for a presentation of, of um, your recommendations, that is also possible. Uh, finally, we want to close the feedback loop of residents uh, engaged by communicating how their input was incorporated in the report or reports to council. I have some outreach and engagement channels and activities here, um, and this public review message, this, this public messaging will be revised again in concert with um, uh, collaboration with the CBOs. That is a whirlwind tour through the expanded community engagement approach, um, and I will pause to see if there's any questions or comments. Um, I know that uh, Commissioner Bruce had a um, uh, memo that, that he sent. Um, Commissioner, maybe just start with Commissioner Bruce if, if you want to speak to that at all now that we've walked through the uh, approach together. Thank you, Lawrence. And thanks for you know the rundown for the public engagement and outreach process. I think in the you know in the spirit of my memo was really to uh, you know like you said meet people where they're at, meet people on their turf. Uh, I know you explained a little bit about uh, maybe due to Brown Act issues and 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 budget and and other limitations. Maybe a focus, you know, additional focus groups amongst the CBOs is not appropriate. But um, if I think, you know, the whole spirit of my memo is to, you know, include our CBOs. If we're going to invest in our CBOs, uh, we need to consider them as true thought partners in uh, in this in this process. So just. Um, you know, if, if focus groups is not, is not, I guess, a relevant activity, outreach activity, uh, you know, giving 
CBOs all the resources and the support they can to facilitate conversations, get up to speed on the context and the background of the city charter, um, making sure that they're sharing and, and, and comfortable sharing ideas, generating ideas, not just um, being presented information and then weigh yeah. in that they're, yeah. you know, so that that's cool. yeah. Yeah, and I, I, you know, one of the reasons why I, I'm eager to get started is so that we can get the right CBOs on board and have a kickoff meeting with them to work through this together and, and really make it a, a workshop so that we can um, develop the messaging with them. Because I, I, I do think that um, their input is going to be critical to, to getting beyond the, the bubble and, um, um, and, and meeting folks, you know, that, that the commission is yet to, to really hear from. Uh, and I, I think you're right. There, there's going to be other ideas that that come up in the process. Um, so we do. There are other ways. I think that um, what is not really reflected in, in this engagement approach is is um, finding other ways to to incorporate. And we'll get into this in the subcommittee um, uh, discussion. Um, but finding the right ways to 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 get the public uh, input even outside of a public hearing, if there's a great idea that comes up that, that a, a CBO hears, you know, how does that funnel into the right subcommittee for consideration? Or, you know, how do we make the content that's on the, the city clerk's office and the, the um, webpage and the, the Charter Review Commission uh, page in particular, like tighter and, and more inviting for, for public involvement. So, um, you know, that's, that's really, and I'm very open to suggestions on all of that, but um, thank you. And I, I totally agree with the spirit of, of your memo, Commissioner. All right, are there any questions for Lawrence about the, what we're proposing? Uh, Commissioner Fuentes. Thank you. Um, generally, um, my comment is that this looks very well developed and thought out and, and a good structure um, for approaching um, the community and to get input. Um, I'm wondering if, um, um, because for me, it's it's really about what questions we ask, and um, and that's the hardest thing because the the most um, obvious question to us about you know the different forms of governments is not the the way that the community is going to comment to us, and so um, my only thought is, will we get um, you know during our regular meetings, will we get um, um, reports back on, especially the questions that, that were being that are being asked of the community as you proceed to do the outreach and get input. I think that we do have the the loop back on a monthly basis, so that they definitely will be working, giving us feedback. Um, we'll also be meeting with them in person, so that we can get that feedback around. Yeah, there. Everyone's talking about this over here, and you guys aren't talking about it at all, or this is what's really confusing. People really don't understand this. People have no understanding of why this is important. All those kinds of questions. I do think I want it to be understood that we're really talking about a, this is a working partner, partner, partner with us to really help us um, in these, this broad community engagement strategy. I would add also that this is not in place of commissioners doing their own outreach. So lots of neighborhood associations, we have that matrix that we did at the beginning, where we really want you all to be doing that as well, and giving us that feedback as well. When I went to the neighborhood association, this is the message I'm hearing, and I don't see where we're doing that. So we'll definitely be able to have those kind of input conversations as well, um, not just on the particular topics, because it may be a different topic that they raise. So yeah, and, and to that point, I would say the material we develop for the CBOs will be in your hands too to help you with your outreach and it'll probably be a little bit more um, user-friendly. Uh, and then the last thing I'll say is that um, in the updated timeline um, for the work plan uh, on June 14th, um, we have a, a, a prep for public hearing number one to have some of those conversations about what the questions look like and make sure we're all on the same page about the format of the meeting and review, review of those, those materials as well. Commissioner Siegel. Uh, thank you. My question is for Lawrence. Is there a final date? There hasn't been too much discussion about additional topics and recommendations um, in that third category. 
Is there a date by which you would like the commissioners to submit topics? Uh, sure. I mean, um, we're getting a little bit into the subcommittee process, but as it relates to the to the community engagement approach, again, this June twenty eighth proposed public hearing is where we'd like to really focus on getting um, the public comment to inform the um, actually this public comment on study session topics. The outcome here really is to hear from the public about what topics should be put into the subcommittee queue for consideration. So I would probably say that that end of June is also when we ask um, um, commissioners to, to try and finalize what the topics that subcommittees are looking at. Um, they're, they're kind of intertwined, but. And will the subcommittees be meeting um... Weekly. Yeah, let's get back to that. Uh, we have we have a, a subcommittee uh, agendized item um, uh, about that after this conversation. Thank you, Commissioner Callender. Uh, yes, first of all, I want to say thank you for putting this together. Obviously, a lot of work and thought was put into uh, to to doing this. Uh, only question I have is it was a process for selecting the community based organizations. I understand the lean nature of having the chair, the vice chair, and the consultant being able to be there um, was consideration. Uh, given to have volunteers from the uh, from the from the commission um, also participate with less than a quorum, so that folks would know that they um, that their voices were heard. Um, so I, I don't know what less than a quorum is. So up to what seven members uh, could participate in this process with a preset date was thought given to that. Uh, I've tried to keep it pretty lean, like you said, to just um, uh, the project manager and me is already uh, worrying about not, not being able to get the CBOs on board. Uh, I'll, I'll def defer to the chair uh, about that. I mean, I would potentially be open to, to having a few more voices as long as it doesn't delay the selection process. Uh, yeah, that was my, we're really just trying to work against a timeline. So we were hoping that um, that commissioners would use their energy to talk to CBOs to get them to apply in this very quick time turnaround. So that's where I'd ask for folks' energy to be. Um, I'm hoping that we can, you know, get seven at least um, organizations so that the selection isn't really a too tough a process that we can pretty much utilize everybody that's uh, wanting to participate. And, and organizations could do it if like Sacred Heart, remember, um, offered to do their um, outreach pro bono, so they could be an organization that doesn't get funding for this. So if there's any organizations that want to apply and don't do that, it could add to it. So that's why I'm just trying to make it as a as quick process as possible and ask commissioners to really help us solicit people filling out the format to get it in. Commissioner Matsumura. Thank you. I want to echo what others have shared and just <clears throat> appreciating a really detailed and thoughtful community engagement approach. Um, I, I had a question and a couple of comments. The question was, and, and <laughs> please laugh right at me if I've missed this, what is the, the budget breakdown for this, both in terms of the additional cost um, for civic makers, you know, increasing the your existing contract to to um, be managing this, and then what is going to be the budget for the CBOs um, sure. who are responding to the the RFP? So to speak. Yeah, the sixty three uh, there was sixty three thousand um, dollars earmarked for community engagement. We're breaking that down into fifty thousand dollars for the CBOs and thirteen thousand dollars for civic makers to do all the coordination. Um, we have a little leeway there, um, but I am, um, you know, the, the, what it's gonna come down to really about um, how many CBOs we can work with is, is what is a fair um, uh, stipend for the scope of work we're asking. And that's something that we would wanna talk directly to the, to the CBOs uh, about as well. Um, if we're able to, to get through um, this work and, and uh, um, have extra budget on our end, um, we're happy to, to, to put it back into the community engagement, but uh, that's the breakdown right now. So I was thinking about $7,000 for about seven organizations, give or take, but that's kind of the ballpark that we would be in if we were gonna try to get at least as many organizations as possible um, to, to with a reasonable stipend for them to be able to have gift cards, all the different pieces of ways that they pay for some of their time, but as well as
pay community members stipends for their participation. So that's that's where we are. So it's pretty lean still. That is very mm -hmm. lean, especially. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, that is very lean, especially if we're talking about um, multiple public hearings, monthly written reports, monthly meetings to weigh in on the process. And you know, I'm I really appreciate that that sort of spirit of collaboration and really wanting to not just say, okay, we're gonna put out some money in an RFP, you do some stuff, you tell us what we did. Like, I get that's the opposite, um, you know, and that's the right way to do it. And, you know, I would just flag that, <laughs> I hate to go back to council again so soon, but just to hear 7K for seven organizations to do this much work and, and you know, there's more than seven priority populations on that list. Um, I, I, I would just say we, we may need to, to think about that because um, I, I think it, it's really helpful to have that broken down and that is concerning to hear it. Yeah, and I, um, I really, to that point, other... I want to hear from the, the CBOs themselves about what they feel is fair stipend. You know, as mentioned, we've done this work with other CBOs um, in San Francisco um, and in San Jose, but not to the same extent. And um, this is actually um, a fairly generous stipend compared to what we've done in other engagements. Uh, it's hard to compare, um, and, and I'm, I'm not trying to undercut anybody, but what I'd really like, and what we've tried to do actually in our past work is ask CBOs themselves about what they think is fair. And so that's something that I would directly ask them, um, you know, to inform where we land, which is why there's basically some, some, still some wiggle on this. Sorry to interrupt. No, not at all. That, that's, that's helpful. And, and I, I think it'll be really good information. And I would just say, you know, that the <clears throat> the budget process at City Council is is coming up. If if we're you know going to see that as some place where we need to take the opportunity, um, just quickly, I I do want to support uh, Commissioner Callender's point um, about you know if if there's other commissioners who want to be involved in the selection process and can can do that in a timely manner, you know, set a meeting to review applications together. Um, and pick them. I just think that this is a place where potentially, you know, we're going to get a lot of scrutiny. That's just, you know, people notice when folks are getting money. Um, and I think the more that we are are able within a reasonable timeline to open up that process, that's, that's really going to build the credibility of it. Um, the last comment that I just wanted to share was to to really support everything that I saw in Commissioner Bruce's memo. I thought it was really thoughtful and um, Lawrence, I know that you, you said you agreed with the spirit of it. And, and for me, it would be helpful to hear a little bit more of just sort of what pieces of that you think you would be able to take to incorporate into the plan. Um, but the, the number one piece that I really saw and wanted to emphasize is just this need. It's, I don't know if we call it focus groups or what, but I think we've, we've heard from multiple sources that those conversations with trusted organizations in depth um, in communities versus versus only supporting the participation through public hearings, we really need to we really need to have the complementary approach. So I think I'm seeing that come through, um, you know, in the reference to having CBOs develop their own um, engagement plans. But I I wanted to make absolutely sure that that's there because I think if if we're over relying on public hearings, we're really going to be erecting more barriers. I, I want to make sure that we're clear that CBO will decide how they want to do the engagement with the community. So if they're going to do focus groups, that's fine. If they want to do a survey, that's fine. Whatever they feel is the best way to get their community engaged and listening. But to come back to the commission is where the public hearing piece comes in. So we're not in any way telling them how to do that. Um, but we want them to come back to the commission's public hearing so the full commission can hear that. So most definitely both, um, they would decide kind of the how, um, and that's, we're not saying you have to do focus groups or you can't do focus groups. We want them to really think that through for themselves. This is a very short amount of time. So it's also a time limited piece. So they might say, well, if I had two years, we would do it this way. But because we're talking about a few months, we're gonna do it this other way. So definitely we want CBOs to be designing their own strategy for what they want to do. Um, and that's the only reason to get to back to the full commission for public. Hearing. 
Let it go to Commissioner Thank Senator, you. Commissioner Tran. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, in terms of, in terms of the, uh, the outreach uh, with the CBO and so on, uh, how do we feel comfortable as commissioners that, that the outreach is going to be uh, to all the 10 council districts, you know? Uh, and I'm, I'm from a high minority um, uh, council uh, district. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, Vietnamese, uh, Spanish speaking residents there so I definitely would want to make sure that we're represented, you know, at the table. So how, how, how are we going to feel comfortable that, uh, that we're going to get uh, the representation that we, that we should get in, in such an important endeavor that we're involved with? Thank you. And, uh, Commissioner Sanchez, are you, is your question about um, with, doing equal outreach to all districts or doing outreach to certain populations to make sure that we hear from those voices? Because what well, we yeah. tried to, go ahead. Yeah. yeah, just to make sure that we reach all those populations throughout the 10 uh, council districts. So, I mean, if you have five or six or seven CBOs to make, to ensure yeah. that the outreach is wide so that yeah. it, all the groups are represented. That's that's my concern. Yeah, uh, and I would encourage you, uh, you know, to 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 look through what we tried to really be thoughtful in laying out here, um, and and the priority populations. Um, uh, you know, I, I think they are they cut across all all districts. Um, obviously, there's there's more uh, folks that are primarily Spanish speaking or. Uh, Vietnamese speaking in certain districts. So if we want to hear from those populations that are traditionally not heard from, then we all have to do more outreach in certain districts. But yeah. what we're trying to do is to, to, to balance kind of more traditional kind of broad uh, broadcast type um, promotion or outreach with that, that deeper kind of reach into communities that traditionally are, are not heard from. So it, it's a balancing act, um, but I, I guarantee that people in every district will hear uh, about this process. Um, if we're lucky, a lot of them will. Um, and again, um, we will absolutely require your efforts to make sure that happens. So the best way that, that we can make sure each district hears about this is that each of you that lives in a district in San Jose, which each of you do, also takes on the responsibility of promoting this. Um, so I hope that that's helpful. Yeah, that, that's very helpful. Okay, thank you. Yep. Mr. Tran. Yeah, I just want to highlight the budgeting issue. Um, but I, you know, let's just use simple math, right? We're talking about seven thousand dollars for seven CBOs, and we're talking about a thousand dollars rough each. Um, I'll, I'll be honest; I just don't see how that plays out well for for any CBO that's you know wants to be a part of this process. We're still we're basically asking them to volunteer, um, and this is me coming from a CBO background with the Vietnamese American Roundtable that does a lot of outreach. Um, and does a lot of you know uh, 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 message sharing for, with the community. Uh, I am very concerned that with a budget of seven thousand dollars, we're expecting to have a good, robust outreach program uh, in partnership with our CBOs. Uh, and you know, kudos to you, you found organizations that are willing to work for that very, very limited budget. Um, but I think you know, if we want effective outreach, we've got to put our money where our mouth is. Thank you, Commissioner Fuentes. Um. I agree with um, Commissioner Tran's um, comments that he just made and um, strongly agree with that. And I thought that um, the CBOs had a budget of $50,000. So I'm not, I'm not clear is, actually how we get to the 7,000, but um, I, I wanted to add that I think it's gonna be very important for the commissioners to be engaged in this community effort um, I think it'll make a difference if, um, like, let's just say you have a focus group or whatever, that people who actually have the responsibility, as we do, to listen and make decisions are present. Um, I think that would give credibility to the, the process, but also it would give more confidence to participants that we are listening. And that when they speak at these, whatever forums there are, the you know, focus groups or however else, the, um, the CBOs um, get the, out, the input from the community. Um, we should do whatever possible to have a process and coordinate so that uh, commissioners can participate in, in any events that's held in the community um, with, by the C CBOs. 
Yeah, I mean, it's going to be complicated. It's going to be difficult. And, and you know, the I, I think uh, some, some sort of level setting about the term focus group might be helpful. When I think of the engagement tactic uh, of a focus group, it involves recruiting um, a specific um, representative panel uh, of, of a population or certain populations to ask um, questions in a conversational manner um, rather than a, a rigid structured survey or a much more kind of informal on the street conversation. Some folks might call an on the street conversation a, a focus group. Um, and, and, you know, I, this is where really relying on the CBOs makes the most sense. As much as we can report back on what the CBOs are doing, uh, absolutely would love to do that. Um, I, I don't know if we're going to be able to do complete coordination around every event that CBOs do and, and the commission. Um, and there's also something to be said about just having the community listen to their trusted partners rather than having a commissioner there to, to skew what's heard. Um, and so, you know, I think that there's there's give and take. Um, I, I, my request would be let's get the CBOs on board. Let's see what they say. Report back to you as soon as we can on their outreach plans and kind of just improve this as we go. Um, because it's um, even seven CBOs doing kind of like multiple outreach tactics over the course of, of six or seven, well, five or six months is, is going to be going to be a lot. And, and I certainly, you know, am committed to making sure I'm, I'm reporting back to you all um, um, as much as possible. Um, and there's also sort of like, you know, there's some balances there. I think there is a difference between um, the people who actually have the responsibility of making recommendations as we do being present in these activities, because yeah. that means that someone is listening who can make a difference and that we really care what they are saying. It isn't the same to have um, these events going on uh, in the community and then us getting, you know, here in our meetings, getting a report back. Um, um, I, I hope that that um, that the CBOs um, understand, you know, how important it is. I don't think the community would say something differently if we're present compared to if we're not present. This isn't the kind of thing where people are, you know, sharing confidential personal information. It's it's where they're giving their opinion and their ideas, and we are we would be doing a very good job as commissioners to be present and and listen. But in order for that to happen, we have to do it intentionally and it has to be part of our plan. And I'm highly recommending that we we do that. Thank um, you. I, the other concern that we talked to the city attorney about is that once we start to basically um, make attendance at public hearings sort of available to commissioners like we were, I hate this it's like I don't I I find myself arguing for the constraints of the Brown Act because uh and I hope we all don't think that like this is me trying to put up obstacles but like this is a design constraint for this process so I, city attorney I don't know if you have thoughts about sort of Brown Act considerations with this process sure uh, yes so if the CBOs are a third party organization and there is an exception under the Brown Act that allows for um, members of a legislative body to attend a publicly uh, publicized event, a community forum or something like that that's put on by a third party organization. That's fine. Um, they can even speak as part of, a, of an agenda or something like that. Uh, the only issue is you can't then use that community um, event as a proxy to uh, conduct a meeting among the majority of the members. Okay, Commissioner Siegel, then Commissioner Monley. Commissioner Siegel. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, are there any detriments to the commission voting on which of the seven community-based organization applications uh, we would like to support? The yeah, the, we would not be able to do a public hearing on June 28th. Um, and that would push the whole timeline back. You know, I, this is again dovetailing with subcommittee, like the the work plan for that. But um, I, I've heard from you all that you want to make sure there's sub a substantial public input to inform the final list of topics that subcommittees deliberate over and bring recommendations to this full commission. Um, the only way to do that, like really, um, uh, well, the way that that we're proposing is to is to host a public hearing on the 28th. That's as soon as we can get one up and running. 
the the next meeting where if we were to, to vote um have a commissioner vote on public um on, on cbo's that would be june 14th that would then basically that we'd that would be at least a week or two to get the cbo process up and running and then another basically so we're looking at end of july for the first public hearing if that's the case so i i've thought through the these considerations and it, unfortunate kind of like it's a constraint of timing so that that's the big detriment commissioner Munley. um yes i it seems to me a very efficient thing for us to do as commissioners as long as this isn't violating anything um, is to reach out to our own neighborhood associations where the populations are. Um, is that correct? I mean, I would love that. That's that's the ask. That's what we should be that's doing. That's the ask. <laughs> you know, yeah. and that's that's what we've been asking you to do all along, and and what yes. we're hoping to with 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 additional with additional funding to, for CBOs to help us develop better materials. I hope it mm -hmm. gives you all the confidence to be able to have more user friendly um, outreach to be able right. to to share with your constituents. Right, and so when we reach out to our neighborhood associations, um, we will have more information. It was, I think most of us were a little shy about doing that sure. before we had enough information. Yeah. Um, but now I, I think each of us really owes it to the commission to reach out to our stakeholders in our own communities. Yes, uh, Commissioner Tran. Sorry, I just forgot to lower my hand. Okay, awesome. All right, um, let's move through the um, subcommittee piece. I'm sorry, I, I'm sorry, I need to do public comment. The first, um, <clears throat> sorry, the first speaker is Alina Yin. Hi, commissioners, thank you. Um, so. From my observation, I still feel that Civic Makers is not qualified to lead this community engagement plan by virtue of what I've been witnessing during this commission meeting, which is very inequitable. This entire time, the lived experiences and expertise of BIPOC commissioners on this commission have not been equitably tapped. What does equity inequity look like? One, the process has been a white-led organization from San Francisco makes a plan and an insular, non-collaborative process, and they bring it back for very shallow comment. Two, a white-led organization from San Francisco makes the most while the CBOs are actually, that are actually executing the equitable process is paid almost 50% less. And you're asking commissioners on here to also volunteer their time and they're not getting paid. There's a list of people and organizations on the end of your work plan that's been on there for several months. Has a consultant reached out to any of them? expecting and accepting number four sacred heart to work pro bono while civic makers again makes nearly double the money set aside for cbo's and every time i've seen a comment made by bipoc commissioners i have not seen it reflected on the work plan and and still they until they started writing memos and honestly i think you know san jose cbo's should be leading this effort and crafting this plan not civic makers yes equity is complicated it is difficult and if you can't handle that maybe it's because you lack the lived experiences of oppression to really be able to be a little bit more creative if you truly believe that equity would be you know if you would have understood the role as a white ally is to lead and present not to lead and present your own ideas but to pass the mic uplift marginalized voices and let them lead thank you next speaker Blair, Be Blair Beekman. Hi, thank you. Uh, Blair Beekman here. Um, you're about to go into subcommittee topics. Thank you. Thank you for going over uh, what, uh, you know, where things are at right now. I wanted to speak on the, uh, how you're going to uh, work on the upcoming uh, election uh, process uh, questions. I guess as a part of it to, to begin first, uh, through all your committee assignments, uh, you're thinking of police task force issues uh, and oversight issues for police. Uh, with uh, words from the woman from San Diego today, I hope you consider the ideas of technology oversight board for a uh, community technology oversight board. Technology is incredibly important in the future. It needs community input and, and a sharing process. And uh, uh, please, I hope you can consider an oversight board for technology. Uh, with that said, with the election board issues, um, or with the upcoming election issues, how to deal with upcoming elections. Uh, just to put it out there, it's really embarrassing, but there's a strong possibility, a pos no, a, a slight possibility, a possibility that we may be having a, uh, 
a, an earthquake, a large earthquake in the San Francisco Bay Area by about 2023. And I, I I hope that these words can help in your decision making at this time. If I'm just brutally honest in saying this, I hope it, uh, I'm not fully knowing if I'm correct or not, but if I am, I hope it can help in your decision making how you have to make choices at this time and really put it into your input box on how to think. Um, if, do I have enough, how much time do I have left, if I may ask? 22 seconds. Uh, 22? Yes. Uh, yeah, um, I, how these issues of earthquake relate to questions of reimagine and equity. If we talk about this openly, that will naturally open the door to health and human services ideas and better de democratic practices and better preparedness and how to leave an earthquake situation. Next speaker, thank you. Matt King. Hi, good evening, everybody. Matt King from Sacred Heart Community Service. Uh, Alina said it very well, so I just want to second everything that Alina said earlier and, and just add that I think one way to think about this is that you could change your meeting schedule um, and not feel like you have to be locked into this. We're not going to meet again for another month and we can only meet on the schedule that we decided and yeah, be flexible, do the job that you are tasked with doing. Uh, that seems like it would be easy enough to change. So again, and once again, a strong second to everything Lena said. Thank you, next speaker. That was the final speaker. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Siegel, you have your hand raised. Oh, I just wanted to say that I am available if we wanted to have extra meetings. Um, I'm perfectly available for that, especially if we wanted to have the commissioners vote on which uh, community-based organizations we're choosing, um, or for any other reason, I'm available. We're, we're on a bi-weekly uh, meeting schedule. I'm happy at this point to move it to a weekly schedule personally. Thank you. Um, thank you, Commissioner Siegel. And could I ask the clerk to address the issue of the schedule? Yes, I mean, one word. Um, when we're doing the schedule, sorry, I'll have to turn off the video because I've got that um, timer as my background. Um, when we're doing the schedule, it's not just you guys. I have to work around all of the council and council committee meetings. Um, if we wanted to hold a special meeting, um, I would need to go through and see who's already meeting. Do I have the staff to, like Tuesdays are out because that's all council. Um, Thursday evenings we have redistricting commission on some Thursdays um, Wednesdays we have some uh, board of fair campaign board of practices are on some Wednesdays so there's there's a lot of scheduling we book you guys ahead of time so we know we've got the staffing in the rooms if you want to have a special meeting we can do that but we have to pull and I have to go through the webinars and the staff to make sure we have a date that we can do that's why we canceled it for the, the holiday it's just getting another date requires a lot of coordination it can be done, just, it's just not that simple. Okay. Um, could we move to the subcommittees? Cause I know there's gonna be a lot of discussion um, and then we can open up for, um, there's been a number of memos and I do wanna um, remind folks to read Commissioner Percival's memo, which is very specific on one particular area appreciate his thoughtfulness on that. Um, and thank you to Commissioner Bruce for his memo and also to the commissioners. I, I'm sorry, I don't remember that also talked about the equity lens um, templates, so which is what we're gonna get to next. I'd like us to have a conversation if I'd ask Lawrence to go through the proposal around subcommittee um, structure and then be able to open it up for your conversation and discussion as well. And then see if there's motions we need to take on Kind of both these issues because they kind of go together. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Chair. Okay. So uh, this is an updated section of the work plan, the recommendations and subcommittee process. Recommendations process has not changed all that much. Um, just want to sort of emphasize here that the subcommittees are basically being tasked with uh, a list of topics uh, to evaluate and develop potential 
recommendations via memo to bring back for discussion and consideration by the entire commission. Um, so um, we do have a recommendation memo template, um, which you've seen before. There were some, uh, the, for those of you who hadn't had a chance to look at the memo from um, Commissioners Brosio and Amador, there might be a few other folks on that. Was, forgive me if I'm, I'm forgetting you. Um, that are proposing uh, adding a few details here um, in addition to the equity implications question. Um, so that is, is up for discussion around um, enhancing the recommendation memo template. Uh, the bulk of the updates here, the subcommittee structure topics and assignments, um, um, basically proposing um, five subcommittees to start. Um, one is a, a, a subcommittee on governance structure tasked with um, the, the topics um, and deliberations around the first two items in uh, directives by uh, council's resolution. Um, this is the uh, related um, subcommittee topics and assignments draft. So um, for the subcommittee, uh, subcommittee of, of governance structure, uh, I've got the first, the, the two directives from council here um, and the list of topics. The second um, um, subcommittee would be the uh, subcommittee on um, timing of elections. Um, there was some proposal to rename this um, voting in elections, which is, is fine. Um, but th these are the, the two, um, um, excuse me, sorry, different. That was the turnout under the, the third bucket. So the, the, the second subcommittee would just be timing of elections to, to look at these two um, directives from council uh, around when to, to have the elections for, for elected office and the to related topics. There was some confusion around the proposal for the, 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 the additional subcommittees. Um, I, I'm proposing here basically um, additional subcommittees that um, address topics under the, the category of accountability, representation, and inclusion. We have enough topics to start the conversation, and there is basically time now for subcommittees to start together, start start to get together and, and talk talk them through. Uh, so the the three topics, and this would be the the, the third, fourth, and fifth subcommittee, would be um, policing and legal system, election turnout, which was the the one that was um, voting in election uh, that was recommended, uh, and then accountability at city hall. Uh, so. Same um, situation. I've got the topics that have come up um, uh, uh, listed here. The idea is that um, um, these are the temporary subcommittees underneath the accountability, representation, and inclusion until we have the that public hearing and the final deadline for submission of topics to inform either the the the. Uh, the list of, of, of conversations for these subcommittees or if there's a need for an additional subcommittee, um, which we would, the, the proposal is after, on the same night of the, of the public hearing on the 28th, commissioners would make a final decision about those topic lists and, and subcommittee. Uh, uh, if there's a need for additional subcommittee or, or rearranging subcommittees, we would decide it uh, on that night. Um, <clears throat> and the assignments for um, the, the subcommittees was based on the um, interest you all shared during uh, a couple meetings ago, uh, trying to really break these out into um, non-Brown Act <laughs> um, quorum concern uh, sizes. Also wanted to just list the interest uh, here so that um, you know the ones that are uh, in italics are, are not the, uh, the attention is that, that these commissioners are not on this commission, but they had expressed interest in it. Um, so we have six folks for the governance structure since it's a bit of a weightier topic. Timing of elections, there's three folks since that's a bit more straightforward, not to denigrate the importance of this issue um, or its relation to other um, parts of the conversation. And then under the broad category of accountability, representation, and inclusion, there would be these additional um, three subcommittees. Not reporting to the, uh, uh, an, an over subcommittee. These are not sub subcommittees. We're just talking about five subcommittees. One, two, three, four, five. There was um, basically uh, one of the memos proposal to do one um, subcommittee to start for accountability, representation, and inclusion under um, 
uh, a fun acronym, uh, which I forget, um, MARI, uh, AMARI maybe. Um, that would run us afoul of, of um, um, Brown Act quorum uh, if we did it that way. Uh, and again, my, my hope here was just to get folks starting the conversation and working now with the idea that uh, we finalize these after public input um, you know, with, with the commission's sort of um, feedback. And then this is just a list of all the folks that had expressed interest in this particular category. Um, the, the subcommittee's roles, work plans, and meeting process built this section out a little bit based on some of the conversation uh, heard from you all, and some of the memos. Um, the, there's some roles here. We're proposing that subcommittees shall select their own leads when they, they meet, uh, and that lead will um, be uh, basically responsible for creating the, uh, a template here for a work plan. Again, this is a draft, um, but basically capturing what the subcommittee is tasked with doing, who the members are, and a list of the topics that the subcommittee is, is evaluating, as well as a meeting schedule. Um, during the meetings, um, this is a, a proposed agenda, which is captured in a um, agenda, a, a meeting notes, subcommittee meeting notes and agenda template, um, which would be basically a way for, for subcommittees to easily take notes and create a report to send back to the full commission before the next commission meeting. Um, that includes date, time, topics covered, and any specific notices or questions for the commission. Um, and a, and a, a, a a template agenda here um, for to, to facilitate um, you know the conversation of the subcommittee. What we're also proposing is that um, because of of the direction the city attorney has given us, um, the as far as Brand Act considerations, um, we feel it best to have each. Um, commissioner on one subcommittee. And what we're proposing is basically a, a reporting back um, by um, subcommittees to the full commission um, during an, an agendized item on each uh, uh, commission meeting agenda moving forward that would allow for um, surfacing any questions or notices that a particular subcommittee would like to bring forward to other subcommittees. So that's where the information exchange between subcommittees would happen during an agendized item. Um, during each uh, commission meeting, once subcommittees have, have begun um, their process. Uh, and the way we would do that is, again, asking each subcommittee to send um, uh, a report before uh, on the the Friday before the next full commission meeting. Um, and that would um, basically seed the topics for that agendized item for subcommittee um, report discussion. We're not proposing uh, basically a, a, a verbal report back for the interest of time, um, but we do anticipate discussion at that point. Um, and then um, there would be additional discussion of the, of the memos, um, uh, recommendation memos as they come up in the, the, the rest of the meeting. Um, and um, I think that was, that's the, the high level overview. Um, I'm gonna stop there. And um, I know that there were some memos uh, about this um, and uh, yeah, open to, to feedback on this. Uh, Commissioner Tran, did you have your hand up again? Yes, I did. Sorry, I wanted Great. to speak to the memo just to provide some additional context uh, and thank you for breaking it down. Uh, let me uh, share that, uh, you know, when we submitted the memo, I think it was actually kind of close to the timing of when we received the memo from Lawrence. So, um, you know, I think there was some alignment here in terms of our ideas. I wanted to present, though, that the, the reason for us framing our memo and our proposal the way it is, is because uh, we wanted to help address some of the procedural issues uh, that kind of uh, been keep uh, coming up over and over over the past four months, uh, which have been very good fruitful discussions, but we also we wanted to be able to find a way to address the concerns of commissioners who wanted to be engaged with uh, multiple conversations uh, and be aware, be made uh, uh, cognizant of the arguments of the resources of the data that comes up in our discussions of different ideas. Uh, so. Let me first I'll explain here that when we are talking about substantive subcommittees, the goal of what we were trying to do was create subcommittees uh, with charges that were large enough to be able to incorporate new ideas as they may arise. Um, the challenge of trying to create these subcommittees is that we just don't know what ideas will arise, and so how do we necessarily organize ourselves around this, uh, around this potential? 
Um, so the idea behind Amari is that it is not a long lasting subcommittee. Right. And it is said, it is stated in the memo, the idea is that at some point we can create specific subcommittees with broad enough charges where ideas can be slotted into them, uh, which is part of the reason why you see in our proposal uh, that we expand the charge of these timing of elections to elections and voting. If we can broaden the charge of this committee enough, then ideas related to elections, um, whether it be funding or sorry, uh, voting or whether it be timing, it can be considered by the same subcommittee. And we can spend, uh, and we can focus more on these broader categories and allow us to work more efficiently toward these ideas. Uh, what we were hoping to avoid is that if we have to create a new subcommittee, every time an idea comes up, that becomes a, a procedural morass and it can drain the time and resources of the commission. So um, as a general broader approach, we thought as we broaden the charges of the subcommittees uh, we can slot in ideas, and these ideas can be considered without having to go through a process every single time of creating an ad hoc committee or some, creating something new. Um, Amari, as it is proposed, allows us to take into consideration the public comments that we can get or the public engagement that we uh, are able to participate in, process some of the ideas and proposals that are brought in, or all of them, to be frank, and organize the subcommittees in a way that allows us to assess them um, in different groups that have broad enough charges where if there are other ideas, they can still be slotted in. Of course, this is not intended to drag out or draw out the process any further than it needs to be. Of course, there has to be deadlines. It's part of the reason why we have a proposed uh, work plan amendment. Um, and that's, but that's the goal, that we want flexibilities in the subcommittees themselves. Um, and we want to do it in a way that uh, is, is reactive and inclusive of the public feedback that we get. Uh, now, and then regarding the uh, subcommittee on commission effectiveness, like the, the work of the commission is growing, right? Um, I mean, we, as we are now talking about working with the city to get additional funding, the, the fact that we actually do have additional funding, the idea that we uh, want to be able to respond and incorporate the suggestions that we get from the public through our public engagement process. Uh, we thought expanding, uh, creating a subcommittee on commission effectiveness allows um, allows the commission uh, to focus some of its procedural discussions among a smaller group of people and hopefully resolve some of these on an amical basis uh, within that smaller subset of uh, commissioners who want to be engaged in those discussions uh, while the rest of us can continue to uh, put work into the substantive proposals. Um, it's a support mechanism for the chair and for staff uh, and that, that's the, the basis for the proposal. Commissioner Cran, does the, um, in your first area, does the way that the five subcommittees um, have been uh, proposed tonight, if, if we said that the charge was broader, like you suggest, but we already start with those five, do you see that as a possibility if the charge is in expanded? I think it would depend on how we define those expanded charges. Uh, and the, uh, you know, the clearest example is just when we talk about elections and voting. We can combine timing with election turnout or you know voting uh, and and we have one subcommittee with a clearly defined charge as is um policing and legal is uh you know i think that can be expanded if we wanted to focus on other services perhaps and accountability as well uh how we define that charge i think would play uh as to whether or not this fits here okay thank you commissioner percival uh, thank you. Yeah. It, so my point was a, a comment, really, and I, I guess a question as well uh, to Commissioner Tran's point that of the five subcommittees listed on the document here that I think it's very difficult to separate the, the number two and number four. Like you can't, um, I think based on some of the things we've heard and certainly some of the memos that, that I've worked on, uh, if you talk about timing, you're also talking about turnout. And, and so to, to have a separate committee that just looks on turnout, I think we would be duplicating a lot of work and actually require a lot of conversations between those two subcommittees. So I think it would make sense to give a committee, a subcommittee like that, to, a broader charge to look at the timing of elections and also turnout. Of course, that also has big implications for accountability and representation and inclusion as well. So I think um, those conversations and study would have to be central to that focus um, as, uh, you know, during, during that, that subcommittee's work. So I just wanted to point that out. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. And if I may, uh, actually, and that, that's actually a very uh, um, fair observation. It's something that was brought up in our discussions as well. Um, the truth of the matter is I don't think there's going to be a way to slice up subcommittees in a way where we have four or five clean uh, um, separate subcommittees where we know where every subject goes into one and it doesn't go into any other. Uh, and I think we want to allow for that. So uh, again, I think one of the big key issues is how, is how we define the charge of each of these subcommittees. I agree 100% that two and four should be combined. Uh, right. Uh, but if we do have certain topics that come up and the topic can fit under maybe two subcommittees, uh, you know, that should be allowed, especially because if we are uh, going to be presenting different viewpoints, that should be fine. Each subcommittee can perform the, the, the analysis the way it wants to and can then be, uh, and then when it comes time for the commission to review it, we get two different perspectives and perhaps the two subcommittees will have a very similar uh, analysis, which great, that's that's consensus. Now, if not, then that's more information for us as commissioners to uh, process. Now, ultimately, the, uh, the memo does spe state and specify that if we do create a subcommission or com uh, commission effectiveness, an SCE for short, we would be able to, uh, we would delegate some of this, of course, the, the responsibility and the trust here, uh, the gatekeeping in a sense to the SCE um, that can produce recommendations to the chair and, count, uh, and staff and the consultant as to where these particular issue areas can and should go. Yeah, and I, I'm gonna ask the city attorney to think about that same question because I, I'm struggling around hub and spoke uh, Brown Act violation if you have an SEC. That I think that's the challenge that I've been thinking about is how do we um, know what the other, um, we know what the other um, subcommittees are doing uh, without becoming a, so that's why we were talking about doing as a body of the whole. So yeah, and, and, you would be able to bring them to the full body. And it could be that, yes, subcommittee, we both want to take it on because you're looking at different perspectives or, you know what, no, you guys take it because we're going to do something else. But that would be a conversation with the full commission. That's the only challenge that I see with that. And that's some, I think the city attorney can weigh in, but I, I, can, I can move on to others. But that's the question I have. Well, I was going to ask Mark to weigh in too about kind of the Amari morphing into other subcommittees and kind of like a, I don't know if it's serial, you know, Brown Act violation, but I'd appreciate Mark hearing your thoughts now. Sure, that, that's fine. And, and you know, I, I can give everybody just a brief overview of what an ad hoc committee is. And, you know, it's the purpose behind it, and it's spelled out in the city sunshine uh, policy. Um, it's a limited commission uh, of a temporary duration, and we set it at six months of the narrow scope and has no decision-making authority because it doesn't compromise a quorum. And when they're uh, done with their specific task, uh, then, the, then the body is dissolved. And, and that's, that's why the Brown Act doesn't apply, largely because of the decision-making authority. Um, standing committees are, um, they are Brown Act bodies, even if they constitute less than a quorum because they have continuing subject matter jurisdiction, meaning they can go on in perpetuity, and uh, they have a meeting schedule fixed by formal action. Um, and you know, generally, um, those are required to comply with the Brown Act, which increases staff and, and things like that. Um, you know, having different subcommittees um, that are ad hoc committees engaging in overlapping topics and things like that is is perfectly fine. Um, the issue then becomes um, how to make sure that the different subcommittees are not um, engaging in serial meetings outside of a, of a publicly noticed meeting or engage, you know, uh, coming up with what's called the collective concurrence, meaning that, uh, you know, for example, election turnout and timing of the election, there's only seven total members of that, but, you know, that also may implicate government structure. And before you know it, through a series of communication between different members, even through uh, the public, you can have a majority reaching a consensus or even just discussing because the Brown Act uh, uh, open meeting requirements involve discussion of items, um, and, and that would um, constitute a violation. So if different commissions are going to be talking about overlapping topics, or different committees are going to be talking about overlapping topics, again, you know, that's fine, but then it becomes more important that the members of those uh, committees um, make sure that they're uh, only communicating with other members of the subcommittees and that any type of coordination or discussion uh, occurs at a regular at the regular meeting or any other meeting that the uh, commission chooses to call 
uh, that where a majority may be present, um, where there's um, adequate notice under the Brown Act and the city's sunshine policy and agenda and, and things like that. All right, um, Commissioner Callender, then Commissioner Marshman, then Commissioner Puentes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, after hearing that, what I'd like to do, just in looking at the lateness of the hour, I'd like to move uh, that we adopt the recommendations of the Johnson Tran Mats Merrim Bill. Second. And your motion includes all um, five. The, all one, two, three. Uh, yes, correct. One, two, three. Appreciate a second. <laughs> one, two, three, four, and five. Uh, that well, I see what I'm looking at. I see one, two, three, A, B, C, D, and yes, correct. That would be correct. I see what you're looking at. I want to be clear. Your memo has section four subcommittee on committee committee. Committee effectiveness is not part of your motion. No, that is part of the motion. I'm moving that we adopt the recommendations. What I'm looking at is uh, recommendations under sub, uh, subsection two recommendations. A, B, C, number two, number three as well. Three A through D. All recommendations, correct. Thank you, okay. Is there a second to that motion? Um, is it weird if I second it? I would find it weird if you don't second your own motion. <laughs> <laughs> <I'll> second. <laughs> um, let's move then. <clears throat> it's been moved and seconded to adopt um, the memo of uh, Vice Chair Johnson, Commissioners Tran and Matsumura from dated May 14. Subject May 17, agenda item V1.2, uh, updated on subcommittee process. Um, commissioners that want to address the motion, Commissioner Fuentes? Um, I'm sorry that I don't have the answer to my question, but if we approve this, this uh, memo, um, I, I have a concern that I was going to express um, and that's and it's related to this memo as well. I'm concerned that we may be setting up a process where we're doing all of this outreach, and yet during the meetings, um, will the public be able to attend and participate in these subcommittee meetings? Um, I think we need to be very um, aware of that and make sure that we are making all of these com um, committee meetings, subcommittee meetings, however we, we label them, um, available to the public and that the public will be able to attend. And I'm not sure if this memo would allow us to do that. So it's a question I have maybe for the um, writers of the memo. No, will we be able to, as we proceed, conduct ourselves so that we can have publicly posted meetings so the public that we're engaging will be able to attend, listen to what we're doing, give us comments, et cetera. Okay, could I ask the city clerk to weigh in here? I think this is also for the city attorney to weigh in. Um, we don't typically have the public attend subcommittee meetings. Well, my question is related to, we're gonna be voting on the memo. And my question is, if we approve um, what's recommended in the memo, if we decide in the future to open these meetings up to the public for input, will we be able to do that if we approve this memo? The memo calls for the subcommittees to be open to the public. So city attorney want to weigh in? My, the, the issue with public participation in subcommittee meetings is that, again, it, it gets to the issue of serial meetings. One that opens up uh, the invitation to other members of the commission who may sit on other subcommittees to participate in a, in a public meeting, uh, take that information and then go back to their, um, to their subcommittee. And I, you know, I don't know if all subcommittee meetings are going to be public or not. Uh, the other issue is with, with the public itself um, going into other 
uh, subcommittees and and discussing what they're doing. Now, you know, all of that is is fine if the subcommittee meetings uh, comport with the requirements of the Brown Act, meaning there's notice uh, of the meeting, an agenda of what items will be discussed. And my understanding is it's largely a, um, a staffing issue in order to facilitate that. And without the staffing, uh, that makes uh, public participation uh, problematic because it, it could facilitate a Brown Act violation. Uh, and public participation can still occur at the regularly scheduled meeting. As, and as I said, at any other meetings that the uh, uh, commission may call uh, where there's an agenda and it's, it's properly noticed. And, and so, you know, the subcommittee meetings can occur um, where individual members can discuss what their recommendations are and then bring it forward to the commission. Um, again, also individual contacts are okay. Um, all the members of the commission may go out and contact anybody that they want and do any facilitation of public discussion and engagement as an individual person. Um, public comment, public communication could also be directed through city staff, the clerk's office, who could then um, uh, present it to the subcommittees um, uh, for consideration as well. Um, and, and this is Tony, the city clerk. We typically, sub subcommittees don't typically have members of the public because you're going to need to post your agenda a month or a week ahead. So now you need to uh, coordinate your subcommittee with the schedules of me and my staff or my staff alone, but we would still need to coordinate those schedules in order to post it ahead of time to allow the public. So the purpose of subcommittees is usually to be more nimble, to allow you to meet whenever you can meet and, and have a, a quick, where, where you can say a day before, hey, like let's meet tomorrow by phone to talk about the, this one little piece that we didn't really hash out. So it allows you to, to go back and forth more. Um, if you're gonna have a subcommittee where you're noticing for the public, it can become a committee of the whole, as Mark said, we're gonna need to agendize it. It's gonna slow you down again. It, so um, a lot of times what you do with the subcommittee is you report out at the next open meeting to say, this is the conversation we had, and then the public can, can hear a report from the subcommittee and make a comment at that time. Okay, Commissioner Matsky. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, this memo has some interesting ish things in it. Um, however, there's some things that are concerning to me that um, we haven't even discussed particularly the subcommittee on commission effectiveness. I'm not even sure what that is. We haven't really talked about why we would want something like that. And it seems like it's an, an additional administrative layer that we really don't need. Um, if somebody has a problem with the way things are, the way the, the, uh, our commission is being handled, um, they can certainly bring it up. So, like Commissioner Fuentes early on in this meeting, she did that, I thought effectively. She had a question about how, how we were all supposed to talk about these things. and it seemed like her question was answered, but if it wasn't, she certainly could have made a motion at that time to change the way we handled it. It seems like that'd be the appropriate way to address things like that rather than a subcommittee just focused on that. Uh, the other issue too then that I look at is, um, is public engagement. I agree, we need to be nimble. Um, again, we had a good um, example a uh, couple times with Commissioner Percival, he's brought up couple things, his memos that he did some analysis, he brought it to us. I don't think anything was lost because the uh, community was not involved in him doing that work. I think this is the time that we would take that information and discuss it and the public and all of us would have the ability to do that. So in terms of this motion, um, I would be voting no for those reasons. I think the better approach is to take what the chair and the consultant have have already presented and what are the good ideas that come from this memo and incorporate it into, into that proposal. I think that'd be a better direction for us to go. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Matsumura. Thank you. Um, so thank you to everybody for the thoughtful discussion so far. Um, just to respond immediately to Commissioner Maitsky's, uh or question about the subcommittee for commission effectiveness. You know, we have, and I believe Commissioner Tran did speak to this briefly, we have spent quite a lot of time in our commission meetings um, addressing issues of, of process. Um, and in a way, the process is 
is only expanding now that we are having additional public engagement. We're having multiple subcommittees. And so the intention of, of the Subcommittee for Commission Effectiveness is not to add another layer, but simply to add capacity so that, that there have been commissioners helping to weigh in on those operational issues before they come to the full commission so that there's some amount of a brain trust and some vetting that can take place there um, rather than, you know, all of that burden being placed on our consultant and our chair <clears throat> to then come up with something. And then we've got to hash through it at the commission. And then potentially there's more changes needed and it needs to come back to another commission meeting. And it's, you know, we're very soon going to need to really be switching over the bulk of our time to talking about the content of proposed charter reforms, you know, appropriate <laughs> compliant updates from subcommittees, understanding some very deep and complex and potentially broad issues that are going to come up. And so it's, it's an effort to, to move some of those process conversations out, some of the more raw process conversations out of the full commission meeting to, to get some commissioners doing that work together so that then we can hopefully have, you know, real focused, efficient conversations at the commission meeting in the way that you referred to. It wouldn't change that, for example, what Commissioner Fuentes shared earlier would still be able to happen, but that that wouldn't be the only place that that could, could happen. Um, I did also just want to follow up on this, this point of um, public engagement in the subcommittee meeting. Um, I share Commissioner Fuentes' concerns about this, obviously, as a signatory to the memo. Um, these subcommittees, as I understand them, are going to be doing very substantive work and very hard work. And as I understand the current proposal, the only way for the public to participate in that would be via email or at the full commission meeting. I'm concerned about the impact on public trust. Um, if there's substantial work happening at meetings where that's, that's their only access, they're only finding out about it or able to participate in writing. And I'm also concerned about the efficiency of that. Say a subcommittee comes up with a recommendation, uh, brings it back to the full commission, it gets aired at the full commission, and that's where we find out that the public has substantive concerns and maybe great ideas that would strengthen the recommendation. That then has to go back to the subcommittee, whereas we could have just heard it at a subcommittee meeting. It could have gotten immediately incorporated into a recommendation and then more efficiently brought back to the full commission. So I understand, you know, sort of there's staffing concerns and there's brownout concerns. I guess to me the bottom line is we've got to figure out those can't be barriers to public engagement. The, the Brown Act is not intended to prevent public engagement. I think there's such a thing as a publicly accessible meeting that's not all the way to the standards of the Brown Act, right? But say a committee is going to meet weekly. It could have its meeting schedule posted online with a Zoom link so that people can call in and participate. It doesn't have to have the agenda posted a week in advance. You know, it's very, we're very lucky to have staff meeting those standards for our full commission meeting. But I believe there's a, a happy medium in between doing full on Brown Act and noticing and zero public access to participate in some of the most substantive work of this commission that needs to earn the public trust. And so I would really rely, you know, on, on our staff to, to say, can we, for example, do the thing that I said? Um, could we hold a committee, commission meetings that are committees of the whole, so they're properly noticed, fully staffed, but we hold committee meetings as sort of um, sections of those, like workshops throughout? I think there might be creative ways that we could do this to address staffing concerns, but but we can't just say, oh, sorry, we, we couldn't figure it out. And so therefore the public has no access to really be part of these live conversations. And again, that doesn't say the committee can't have an impromptu meeting as well, but the weekly meetings that we're supposed to be having are, are just going to have no public access. I, I'm very concerned about how that hits us when we come out on the other end. Thank you for uh, the floor. Commissioner Marshman. <clears throat> Uh, first of all, I, you've been operating, the city has been operating uh, subcommittee meetings, typically 
not public. I, am I correct in that understanding? City council, uh, you know, sub subcommittees are not typically uh, open to the public. Is that correct? City council subcommittees are open to the public. They're noticed a week ahead of the meeting. They're staffed. They're arranged ahead of time because there's so many. Right. It's like a regular council meeting. So, so how is this going to be different if we can do it non? public and I'm all for flexibility. I, I think we really need that now to get things done quickly, but I'm, I'm just curious how this is different. What subcommittees now are not public? I thought either you or Mark said something about that. Well, they, they've had ad hoc subcommittees that okay. don't okay. have to be public, but the standing subcommittees are all public. Okay. Those are scheduled out six months, um, six months to a year in advance. Okay. To make sure so, that we have the, the staffing. And then we now have the mandate to have interpreters at every meeting. I'm okay. budgeted for your regular meetings. I'm not currently budgeted to have interpreters. Meetings. Okay. If we're going to have those as public meetings, we're going to have to have interpreters. Okay. So the difference is ad hoc subcommittee. And that's what we're going for, for here, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, more, ad hoc standing committee is probably ad, more appropriate. Okay. Okay. Um, I, I, I will vote no on accepting the whole memo. I did want to say that I liked the uh, governance structure committee description and the elections and voting uh, description. I thought they both pulled together um, the ideas that are relevant. I, um, uh, I, I, feel, I feel like uh, electing a city attorney and electing a, um, a police chief should be part of government structure uh, um, because every, the way I see it, everything we're doing is going to be seen through the lens of accountability, whether it's, uh, you know, item two, I mean, everything is, is uh, to make things better for the community. Um, uh, those are just observations. I really like the two descriptions there. I understand the the uh, the Amari proposal. If we had a couple of years, I think would be a great idea, but I don't think that will work. Uh, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Monley. Yeah, I, um, I think Commissioner Marshman uh, touched on part of what I was about to say too, which is um, the being an ad hoc committee, um, we don't need to publicly um, uh, uh, message this. I think that uh, as far as I can tell, this is an ad hoc committee is almost like a working group which is, um, to my way of thinking, something that um, we can make a decision that we need to get together and talk to, to each other about an issue that we haven't gained clarity on yet so that we can gain clarity and then present it to the commission. And I, I honestly don't think we need to have uh, a, a person from another, a commissioner from another uh, subcommittee come in to see how efficient our work was um, before we go to the commission with it. That just feels like a bit of overreach to me. Thanks. Vice Chair Johnson, you had your hand up. Um, Sorry, were you my, speaking? No. Oh, I was just saying, um, yeah, my comment was answered already. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Zad. So is the memo that's under discussion, uh, are we just, is it just a vote with regard to rejecting the committees that were set forth by our, our uh, consultants and substituting the, the, the committees, uh, subcommittees that are in the memo? Is that the issue? And the, I'll ask the maker of the motion. Mr. Tran? Is that the maker of the motion? Yes. 
Uh, so they, there's three parts to the uh, the memo. The first would replace the committee, the subcommittees that were proposed uh, by uh, by by Lawrence, um, just by just by expanding the scope of the uh, of the subcommittees. So it's it's a way to expand the scope of it. But we're still looking at right now two subcommittees that have defined uh, charges and a third that um, that that is more open. Uh, the okay. new proposed subcommittee is what number recommendation number two is for, and that would be for the um, subcommittee on commission effectiveness. And uh, recommendation three is just updating the work plan to account for the changes. Right. So it's it's basically not going along with our consultant. Um, and so it, it's it's not touching on the uh, the consultant's uh, work product of recommendations uh, for the subcommittee process or. The roles or the the way the so it's not touching on any of that 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 the that the consultant talked about. Or uh, is no, it? nothing in the 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 memo is intended to comment on or change the role of the consultant. Okay, all right. I I'm also not not comfortable voting on on uh, this uh, memo. I I don't see the need for the for the committee on uh, for effectiveness. Um, I think that the. Uh, uh, the committees that were put forward by the uh, consultants uh, take into consideration all of the uh, concerns that are expressed in the memo uh, because it's, it's talking about five committees. Um, and um, I, 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 I agree with uh, uh, Commissioner um, Monley with regard to having another committee overseeing the work of all the other committees. Um, with regard to the, the public uh, participation, I think that you know we want public participation in a lot of this, but the, these com subcommittees are basically going to function like ad hoc committees, and ad hoc committees do not have public participation. Um, they're meant to be working sessions. They're meant to be a way for all of the members to to get together and really uh, work uh, diligently on a particular issue, and then bring it once it's been vetted and once it's been massage, then bring it to a to a point where it can be discussed uh, with the public and with the the remainder of the of the commission. So um, my other concern here is that it's under item three. It says allow for commissioners to be members of both the SEC and one other subcommittee. I, I think that's going to violate the Brown Act. So I won't be voting for this memo either. Thank you. And then I'm going to go Commissioner Matsumura, then Commissioner Callender. I see your hand up, but I'm going to try to get folks that haven't spoken yet on this issue. So Commissioner Matsumura first. Thank you. I just um, wanted to request a clarification. I'm not understanding the concern that there would be subcommittees supervising other subcommittees. Uh, can somebody clarify for me, Commissioner Monley or Commissioner Luzat, uh, where that perception is coming from? Um, I'll go ahead and address it. I, I just, as a working group, we are assigned um, a task to do. And the four members of the working group or the ad hoc committee uh, are going to do their task according to their best judgments. Um, another commissioner who is part of another committee coming in and overseeing or judging the effectiveness is going to be subjective and um, or is likely to be subjective, not objective as the committee is attempting to be. Um, and I just don't, I don't see that as proper and I don't see it as uh, productive. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just I'm missing something here. Where is it proposed that another committee would come in and judge the work of a subcommittee. That's that's what I'm I'm not understanding. I understand the critique of that, but I don't understand what's the thing that would cause that to happen. Well, uh, uh, in response to the commission work plan, including but not limited to subcommittee deliverable structure and operations, is having that committee overlook the the other committees, and that's that's not acceptable to me. Nor is nor is having somebody other than look this this was set up 
with a with a chair and a vice chair and a consultant. And now you want to put in a committee that's going to look at uh, funding, budget oversight, public engagement, all of the things that we're supposed to either be letting the consultant do with our um, input. Uh, and I think just adding this other committee is just adding more bureaucracy and more um, uh, we're just going to get wrapped up and having, you know, five, six people doing this as opposed to the entire commission have us having a say so I don't think is acceptable to me. Okay, Commissioner Callender, thank you for your patience and then Commissioner Marshman and then Commissioner Tran. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I just want to talk to why, why I supported the motion. I think that I've heard a few things that may be a challenge, including the Brown Act issues on the public participation. However, I'm still supporting the motion and where I was. Maybe if after the discussion, if we want to remove that, I mean, and I'll listen to the other commissioners, but remove the, the public access and then ask for council to come back with how we could potentially involve uh, the public in the future. Because I under, I, this was something I mentioned two meetings ago. I definitely wanted to make sure that the public was involved. But here's the thing is we, we've got to be able to do the work and I'm not sure that there may be a solution to that, but I don't want that to be what would kill the motion because what, I, what I'm looking at is a structure that makes sense. We, the way that we've broken it up into the five committees with policing and accountability and those really thinly held uh, thinly held topics, I think if you're looking at the, po um, maybe policing should be under the additional measures, but when we're talking about the, uh, the timing of election, that should really probably, I mean, not the timing, but the election turnout, that should probably be combined with the timing of elections. I think that this is a much more effective way to have a conversation. The subcommittee on the Commission of Effectiveness, I didn't really see it as overseeing others, but what I saw it doing is pulling in the commissioner so that we are not having this big discussion every time on the work plan, but there's a small subset of us that's working on the work plan so that when it comes back, it will have uh, much more input and hopefully we'll be able to move this process along. We've been talking about the same process, the same work plan since January. Here we sit in the middle of May. And so what I see this as is a much more productive and efficient model in order to, to move things along. And that's why I made the motion. And that's why I'm supporting this memo. Um, I do have concerns with the public access of, after hearing from, uh, from the attorney. And I don't know what the solution is. Uh, for, for that component. So I'll, I'll look to others and maybe that's uh, if there's someone that would make a friendly amendment to remove that and then kick it back to the attorney um, to figure out if there's a solution and path for public access, then maybe that would ho hopefully make this more palatable versus sink under the, uh, uh, because of the legal concerns. Um, and the city attorney has his hand up. I'm gonna ask him next. Yeah, and I, and I can comment. I mean, we're happy to look into that. I mean, it's something that, uh, we can do. I mean, one of the, you know, part C is of, uh, of subpart three is recommend policies and practices to reduce the risk of Brown Act violations um, and maximize commission effectiveness and public engagement as referenced above. And one of the things, and what I'm hearing is with the way that these commission committees are, are, are panning out is, is going into the area where they're not ad hoc committees, and then they might fall into the standing committee, which would be subject to the Brown Act. Um, and so, I mean, that's one of the things that this commission can do is, is or the subcommittees can do is, is uh, work with staff to uh, make sure that the requirements of the Brown Act are complied with. And so public access under the Brown Act and public uh, discussion under the Brown Act not only includes public comment, but it also includes notice of the agenda of what will be discussed, when and where the meeting will be held, as well as other considerations for uh, individuals with disabilities, translation um, and the like. And of course, there's the city sunshine policy, which adds additional layers and timing to that. Um, it, it's not intended to be an impediment, but it is what uh, the law uh, requires with respect to um, ensuring that the public has notice of what's going on and so that the uh, commission is not making decisions um, among the majority of the members outside of, of a properly noticed meeting. Um, and, and so, um, and so that would be the re recommendation. Other recommendations that we've thrown out is, is individual contacts are okay, um, standing items on the agenda where the subcommittees can discuss and present reports and coordinate. Um, and in, in addition, if, if staffing is available, um, uh, additional meetings other than the regular meeting uh, could also be noticed. And so I just would add to that list, uh, Mark, that we also have the CBOs. So the CBOs. Yes, correct. The CBOs, yes, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the exception under the Brown Act allows uh, commissioners to attend 
uh, events and publicly held events that are put on by third party organizations, uh, so long as those events do not become a meeting in and of themselves. Okay, so uh, Commissioner Callender, you uh, offered a friendly amendment to your motion, which was to eliminate three uh, small letter B, ensure public access to participate live in all subcommittee meetings. If that maker of the motion is uh, is a second to that, Commissioner Tran, are you? Yes, even though I'm the maker of the motion, I did want to at least honor the three that were that were on the memo and give them the, uh, the opportunity to make that motion if they believe that doesn't take away from the central portion. But I do believe that makes sure at least a part of this. Okay. And Commissioner Tran is a second. Are you accepting that friendly amendment? Um, you don't have. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I, I'm um, to save the um, other parts of the discussion, which I think are important. I'll agree to the friendly. Okay, so we have the we have the memo in front of us uh, with the elimination of item three B: ensure public access to participate to participate live in all subcommittee meetings. That's deleted from. Uh, the motion. Um, I think we've had uh, enough conversation. I'm going to call the question. Um, so a yes vote means that you want to adopt um, the commission memorandum. A no vote means that you do not want to adopt it. And I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Oh. If I may, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, um, I actually had another um, um, suggested friendly that could help potentially address the serial meetings issue. Okay. Uh, and I'll offer it to uh, Commissioner Calendar as well. Uh, if the concern is that commissioners are going to be bouncing around from meeting to meeting and that can be, you know, cause problems, um, we can bar participation from any uh, commissioners who are participating in a subcommittee that is considering the same matter. I would accept that. Okay. If, if I could weigh in as well, it's not just the concern about uh, commissioners themselves, but it's a concern about the public. Um, facilitating a serial meeting among among uh, different subcommittees. Yeah. I mean, I, mean I, I don't know how to address that. I mean, the same problem comes up with any standing committee or, or groups of uh, committees, right? I mean, if you have people who want to coordinate an issue that comes up before the Housing Commission and the Neighborhoods Commission, they'll be able to do that, right? Right, but the meetings then are, then, but then the discussions occur at a, a publicly noticed meeting. Okay. It's, it's 921. I'm going to call the question. If there's a new motion that wants to come back afterwards, with the, the, with the will of the commission is now. So I ask the commission uh, clerk to call the roll. I'm sorry, was there a second to the motion? Yes. Pardon me for interfering. Yeah. Yes. There was. Okay. Motion is uh, uh, Commissioner Calendar, second by Commissioner Tran. <clears throat> I'll call the roll. Uh, we'll start with Barbara Marshman. No. Christina Johnson. Yes. Elizabeth Monley. No. Ellie Matsumura. Yes. Enrico Calendar. Yes. Frank Maitsky. No. Garrick Percival. No. George Sanchez? Yes. Sorry. Hui Tran? Yes. Jeremy Barus? Yes. Jose Posadas? No. Lynn Diep? No. Linda Lazat? No. Luis Barosio? Yes. Magnolia Siegel. As clarified regarding no oversight on, uh, on other subcommittees, I'm voting yes, as clarified. Um, you know what, I just, I, I'm gonna hold one second. Um, I wanna ask the clerk, do I need a public comment on this before the vote? We, we can take it after. And then if anybody wants to move to reconsider the vote based on public comment, we can do that. Okay, thank you. I apologize. Continue the, the roll call. Maria Fuentes? Yes. Sammy Robledo? No. And Sherry Sugara, I believe absent, she's still absent. 
and so are T Tran and Veronica Amador. So let me count the no's. You have Yong Zhao. Oh, sorry. No. no. Okay. So with that no, I think we're at a tie. The motion fails. Um, do we take Fred's vote? Yeah, Fred is the tiebreaker. So Fred, it's your vote. <laughs> I really was hoping for the direction here. All right. Um, so I'm going to vote no, and I'm going to take this uh, memo and ask that the consultant and I consider all the points that are made here to see what we can incorporate into the proposal that we've brought before you. Um, hearing the will of the commission, I don't think that I, I hear the sense of, of what you're asking for, and I will um, pledge to consider this memo very carefully and try to figure out all the ways we can incorporate the spirit of this into our proposal um, and see what we can bring back to you. Um, and I'll hold, um, I will ask for public comment and then um, we can see if there's a, 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 an, a another um, reconsideration. Before we go to public comment, I wanted to um, just display the vote. So now I'm going to go to public comment. The first speaker is Roland. All right. Well, I hope you're all sitting down here because I'm going to let it rip. Okay. What just happened here is beyond unacceptable. You're supposed to take public comment. You go before you go to vote. Second thing I'm going to bring to your attention is that you're getting some serious misinformation, both uh, from uh, city council and uh, from the city clerk. That speaks to why you went to council and you ask for an independent council. So let me show you what the issues are here. The Brown Act is completely gray on other committees, and I'm challenging Mr. Valley and the PRA to quote me the specific section of government code says that there's a difference between a standard and other committees in the Brown Act, because I know the Brown Act and I sure as hell don't know where that is. Now, you also seem to have forgotten this presentation that you had from Denver uh, last time that told you that these subcommittees, as Commissioner Matsumura pointed extensively, were an extraordinary opportunity to gather additional um, uh, comments from, from the general public. And I'm going to close up and tell you, yes, the Brown Act is unclear, and quite frankly, at this time, I'm going to pass legislation to clear it once and for all. But the League of Women Voters has emitted a very clear opinion that if another committee is appointed by a brown acted governing body, that other committee automatically inherits brown acting. And I'll be happy to forward it to you. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Sorry, Blair Beekman. Hi, thank you, uh, Blair Beekman here. Um, I think those were some interesting words by uh, the previous speaker, and I, I really took them to heart. And uh, thank you for his words. Uh, and what I think can be some good direction. Um, the, the few ways that I can help, uh, the city of Berkeley has a subcommittee process uh, to its committee meetings and commission meetings. and. It is usually a, a public process. I, I would invite yourselves to look into how they can work, how, how they work and uh, for good examples. Uh, it's, pretty, it's pretty complicated how they work in Berkeley. They allow people from all parts of the Bay Area uh, to work on a subcommittee process. And it's real interesting. And I invite you to look into how they can work as, as ideas of openness that they do go back and forth about and, and openness has won out in the end. And so uh, openness to the public and open process. Um, and, and just to, to quickly offer, uh, you know, the Brown Act says, uh, it's my understanding that 72 hours is, is the time to allow, uh, to prepare the public for a meeting and, you know, to give yourself 72 hours or 
whatever the next after 72 hours is 96 hours, you know, uh, to allow Tony to work 96 hours to prepare a, a meeting process, uh, maybe that can be enough for the nimbleness needed. Um, I guess that's about all for myself. Um, uh, that's all I, I guess I can contribute to. Uh, I, I really uh, feel the an importance to have the open public process. Maybe is there a way that you can have variations of of a closed of a uh, subcommittee to be uh, closed meeting and open meeting? Maybe that's a variation you can offer sometime. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Call in user number one. I mean, this is going on for hours, and something tells me you guys want to keep things secret versus put sunshine on things. Maybe I'm mistaken, but uh, they need to be more open. There needs to be more public comment. They're starting to limit things down to one minute like they do at the – like the snotty people at the county do. I, I think it should be three minutes, if not five minutes, that we get to speak. They hardly have many callers. Who call in right now or even attend the city council meeting sometimes the only person who's there is either myself or blair bankman and i find it uh, really odd how long and drawn out this discussion is with a lot of five dollar and ten dollar words uh it's hard to follow uh, if you're not really concentrating so who's listening right you know i uh, hope more people are i'm trying to, to decipher everything but uh, they seem to want to keep the public out by any sort of, you know, decorum rules or any sort of things that are set out, you know, not supposed to address people. They make it impossible for you to speak. And, and then if there's any rule broken, they hang up on you or they tell you to leave the podium. It's, it's really, really fascist, I have to say. I mean, it, or I should say it's fake. They make you think that they have sunshine laws, that they do everything they can to, to shut you down and uh, the, not allow people to speak, speak their mind. They, they want things to stay real corporate, clean. Uh, you know, someone calls this state Zen fascism, and what, that's what it is, Zen fascism. Fake, flowery type, uh, oh, we love everybody, we're transparent, we have equity, there's engagement, and there really is none. And it sounds as if there. It sounds as if what's happening now is that uh, you guys want to make it so there's less public engagement. That that's the feeling. On that was the final speaker. Thank you. Um, now we'll move to public comment on on items not on our agenda. I'm sorry. Wait a second. The city attorney has his hand up. All right. Okay, uh, move to- We need to ask if anybody re will reconsider their vote in light of the public comment. Is there anyone that would like to reconsider their vote on the last motion? Seeing none, I'll move to the open forum. This is public uh, comment um, on the, I'm sorry, Commissioner Fuentes. Um, I wanted to bring something up. Um, this, this, this will be our last item, is this correct? Before we adjourn? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So I wanted to bring up um, when we were talking about the, um, our work plan, that I would like for our next meeting to be placed on the agenda, a discussion of whether or not we should establish some bylaws. Um, I know that all the committees that, um, I mean, as I understand it, um, city commissions and boards um, may have bylaws and ours doesn't. And I looked into it during the week and I had um, uh, an exchange with um, um, attorney Vanny and that um, I understand that if we would want to establish some bylaws, just some general working bylaws that the um, city attorney and the city clerk would draft those for, this, for us. But I think before we can even consider um, um, whether or not we want bylaws, it should be placed on our agenda. And I request that we place it on our agenda for the next meeting. Okay. If there's without objection, we can put that to the agenda. See what. Thank you. 
Commissioner Matsumura. Thank you. Uh, just point of order, I, I might have missed this earlier. Um, I believe it was Commissioners Amador and Barosio who put forward some thoughtful work on the, the template for um, subcommittee recommendations. Uh, and I, I just wanted to confirm when we're going to be able to follow up on that. Lawrence, do you want to weigh in? <clears throat> yeah, hi folks. Um, <clears throat> I have the memo up and I just want to make sure that I can. Uh, so yeah, I appreciate it. Um, the the additions to this uh, to this template and from what I can see, let me share my screen. The the major additions are um, adding a, a second question: How has this issue or problem benefited or burdened people, especially Black, Indigenous, Latinx, Chicanx? People of color, immigrant, undocumented, low-income, uh, houseless, um, and then um, uh, da, 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 da. community engagement. How was this? Uh, how was this engaged and involved during this process? Uh, how were community members informed, etc.? Must just be a charter revision was already there. Um, uh, and uh, analysis and strategist. Um, how the proposal increase or decrease racial equity, um, what are potential unintended consequences, and then accountability. So um, there are, let's see, to review one, two, three, four more questions, some of which uh, align with um, some of the, um, uh, the recommendations from the um, Johnson uh, Tran Matsumura memo. Uh, in particular, kind of where, what's the source for the data? Um, so I see some alignment there that we can incorporate. Um, the only comment I would have is just, um, uh, I, I think adding uh, additional questions here to really emphasize this is great. I, I, I just worry about sort of the length and, and the conciseness. So I might kind of propose um, uh, incorporating these two bullets uh, elsewhere. Um, I, I think overall, um, so, so, Overall, I, I think they're, they, they add a lot of um, depth to this. Um, I just, um, I, I'd like a, a crack at coming back and, and, and incorporating them um, and bringing them all to you. If there's specific recommendations or thoughts from the commissioners that they can share quickly, uh, yay or nay on this, um, happy to hear them or we can follow up you know, via email. But um, uh, Commissioners Bruce and Amador, well, uh, uh, Barosio, excuse me, not Bruce, uh, Barosio, uh, Commissioner Amador is not here. Do you have any thoughts about, about that approach? Hello, Lawrence, um, and Please. good evening, commissioners. No, thank you. Thank you for taking the time, and thank you, uh, Commissioner Matsumura, to um, ensuring that we touch on this. Um, the spirit of this is is to add, um, as as Lauren said, a little bit more depth, um, a little bit more clarity on on how some of the proposals will be will be will be um, seen through. Um, so, Lawrence, if you can. Um, one, when does this go live? Like, when can we begin to publicize this process? And then two, um, uh, I think I think that's an agreeable process. Um, you you obviously see our feedback, and as you say, like you'll take it back, um, and you'll see what you can do in terms of incorporating uh, some of the language and the spirit. Um, but in terms of the timeline, um, can you share a little bit more about that? Sure. I mean, I, I, we haven't talked about this, but um... You know the the proposal uh, proposed changes to the work plan um, and the discussion tonight is intended to to kick off the um, um, uh, subcommittee process and that would include um, sort of a a more formal communication um, to you all about how to do that um, and some coordination on our end so that work can be happening between now and June fourteenth. So uh, one of those things would be revising um, both the, the work plan subcommittee process uh, and, and these documents based on, on any feedback we've heard, um, uh, you know, especially the, the, the structure of the subcommittees themselves, which uh, again, to Chair's point, um, 
a lot of great conversation and I think we've understood where we can really improve what's been mapped out, um, which is always a great thing. So thank you for, for the, the, the input and, and thoughtful conversation. Um, and, you know, um, to the it becomes a sort of a, a question to the, to the ad hoc standing committees, to the subcommittees about when they want to move forward. Um, I, I probably, you know, if, if we do need to make a revision to, to any of these documents, the templates that is um, in flight, I think we can do that and just make sure or we're using the most up-to-date version. Um, but the intention is to get these in your hands um, as soon as we can um, um, after tonight and, and get you working. Chair, is that your understanding? Yes, Vice Chair Johnson. You're muted. You're unmuted, but we still can't hear you. We lost you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yay. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, I would like to request to be moved to the governance subcommittee. I was wondering if that is okay for me to do that now, or should I save it for the next meeting? I want a clarification on that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I think that'd be great to, I've had a few emails come in from folks um, with um, some thoughts about subcommittee assignments. Uh, we can definitely move things around. If there's any folks that have a strong um, feeling or, or interest in, in being on a, a different subcommittee, um, either you know, let me know now or, or follow up with email as soon as possible. The intention here is to try and get these um, uh, uh, solidified as soon as possible. Uh, again, trying to make the assignments based on your, um, um, your express interest, but uh, always want to make sure you ha you're, you're focusing on the things that's most of, it, most of interest to you as you know more about the process. Commissioner Barosio. You're muted. <laughs> there you go. Um, along, along those lines, uh, I saw that um, the numbers were pretty were pretty even six six three four 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 i believe yep. um is there is there a target goal um is it is it one third of the commission just in case people talk so we're still under it's um, a, it's enough below 11 so that we don't run into quorum issues oh, okay, um perfect. yeah yeah um and and i i you know in full transparency i, I think the idea of um uh, and to let you know i i what I heard tonight that I, I think is a great idea uh, is to combine the election timing and the turnout into to one subcommittee, um, which um, uh, I, and so there, there might be a little bit of a shift that happens. Um, but I, again, the subcommittee topics list was, was based on what's coming come up here. And, um, you know, we will always have the chance to, to uh, update that as necessary moving forward. Um, so that will probably shift the, the numbers a little bit, but we're, we're trying to keep this both manageable for Brown Act reasons, but also manageable for coordination reasons. Um, getting 10 people on a call together while not always necessary, you know, the intention is to, to make sure that you all can meet um, and coordination becomes tough <laughs> over five, five or six. Um, additional thoughts uh, on this? Um, Again, thank you all for your input. Uh, oh, just yeah. briefly that that if there is, it, it's it, it seems like um, you and the chair are going to be potentially continuing to somewhat rework the scopes for the subcommittees, and and so just recognizing that folks may want to request changes once those become clearer. Yes. Uh, yep. Forgive me if I'm stating the obvious. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is this is all um, you know trying to put something out there for your feedback and, and um, be as responsive as possible. So. Um. Thank you. I just want to express appreciation to everyone. Um, Lawrence, the chair, thank you so much. Um, I would ask that uh, for our next meeting to, to add the topic for um, our city attorney to address the public's concern um, specifically uh, one of the speakers had a very different um, and strong view of the Brown Act being gray in terms of um, subcommittees. And whether that's true or not, I, I really would appreciate if um, our city attorney clarifies that for the public, because three of the pub members of the public who were here all had a very different understanding of the Brown Act. So if the city attorney could please 
um, specifically address their rebuttal and their understanding, I think that would be great for the public. Thank you so much. Thank you, Commissioner Siegel. I was gonna ask for the same thing. So I appreciate your request. Um, I wanna apologize for not taking up the item on the template. Um, I, it just, it, it's off my list and I forgot, but I had read it before and I just didn't add it to my apologize to the commissioners for their uh, hard work that I didn't recognize during our official meeting. Any other items? Then we'll go to open forum for the public. So um, members of the public who wish to address the commission on an item that's not on our agenda that is pertinent to this commission. Sorry, the first um, is Colin user one. Yeah, I, I just like to say that this uh, city council that we have and the city government is so far left. Nobody wants to say it, you know, usually you're not allowed. You'd be, I'd probably be cut off by this time by San Bacardo. But imagine you had to take a city like San Diego that usually votes Republican and uh, even brought about a Republican governor, which is Pete Wilson. You had to have them come to San Jose or, or have to have them as a guest, I should say, to show how you're supposed to run a city government. When you go to San Diego, they have public pools that are amazing with slides and diving boards. Do we have any decent public pools here? Answer, no, right? We've got a rose garden and it has grass that looks like, go oh, I don't know, terrible. Bathrooms that are public parks, terrible, dirty. Rose garden fountain broken all the time. I mean, there isn't any shining examples of anything, of any kind of civic uh, excellence by this town ever. Uh, and the downtown looks like it's all, you know, it, was, it looked like there was COVID before COVID. You know, papered windows, four lease, four rent, for sale. Uh, restaurants, uh, how many restaurants have uh, gone, gone out of business in the last 30 years? It's like you've got 30 different restaurants in one location in 30 years. Everybody tries to make it down there. They can't. Movie theaters shut down. Fairmont Hotel bankrupt. I mean, this city, I mean, the, the homelessness everywhere. The, the Highway 280 at 87 Guadalupe Parkway looks like looks looks like a big toilet flush uh, backed up there. It just looks terrible. This town is it, it needs guidance, and I think San Diego is not a bad idea. Thank you, next speaker. The next speaker is Roland. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I thank you all for your service at this uh, uh, late hour. Um, and, and I appreciate you all following up on this um, uh, legal issue. I, I had hope that the uh, attorney who had his hand raised because could somebody please mute their phone? Thank you. That he had somehow found the relevant section of uh, government code backing up the statements that he made earlier. But let me move on to the um, actual thing I want to talk tonight since we're not going to be allowed to be part of the conversation until you're done uh, with your deliberation is to follow up on the discussion we had last time about uh, changing the election cycle. And we talked about um, having a, a two year followed by potentially another two, four years, so a total of 10 years um, in this particular case. And I did find um, a, a 2020 memo from council member Car Carrasco essentially saying pretty much the same thing, except she said, we're not gonna count uh, the, the two year term. Um, but what I would like to do in the sake of fairness is to have it both ways. So supposing that yes, we do go ahead and we have one two year term and then two four year terms for a total of 10 years is to make it fair at the other end for Mayor Ricardo to express an, an interest in serving for an initial two years except he didn't want to go and have an election. He just wanted to have his term extended, which obviously I was never gonna pass muster is in this particular case, is give Mayor Ricardo an opportunity to run for the two-year term 
but obviously only Mayor Ricardo this in turn would give him a total of 10 years and he would have the same opportunity as whoever his successor will be. And that's my two cents for tonight. Thank you. Thank you, next speaker. Alina Yin. Hi, thank you. Um, I had my hand raised earlier, but I'm not sure why it wasn't registered for the after the subcommittee vote. Um, I do believe it as um, another speaker shared that there is a lot of gray area in the Brown Act. And also in the 50 plus years that the Brown Act has been around, no one has ever been prosecuted under the Brown Act. And not to encourage people to violate it, but I think that there is room to have open public meetings. And I know that there is concern with serial meetings on the public side, but really to kind of uh, articulate that you don't trust the public or that you don't trust your commissioners to understand that they can or cannot speak or should not speak on a certain subject. I think everybody here is very intelligent and they can understand when the rules are clearly laid out about them, how to follow them and how to be, you know, in of integrity in this process. Also, you know, this in this vote, Commissioners Amador and Segura were not here to vote. And so I really like question the legitimacy of like this tie and that I think there should be more thought and consideration in regards to other commissioners um, speaking about the subjectivity of reviewing a commission effectiveness. I think if there's clear metrics for discernment, much like a performance review, if you're able to objectively review your own work and discuss it collaboratively, I think that you can do that. And if you're saying that people can't be subjective and you know speak about their process, whether what worked or what not worked, you're kind of disregarding the whole process of improvement because that's how you improve, is that you look back on your work, you see what worked, what didn't work and where you can improve. And also, I was really disappointed to hear some of the commissioners really, you know, just right after the vote saying, this is a failure, you don't pass. This is not a game. You should not be working against each other. It should be in the spirit of collaboration and you should really be listening to all of the members and understanding their concerns, not just disregarding it over parliamentary procedures. And Thank you, next speaker. Sorry, Matt King. Hi again, uh, same thing on raising my hand previously and uh, maybe uh, maybe we're not being clear enough on okay, public comment is open, the last call for public comment, public comment is not closed. So I would appreciate more clarity on that. And when hands are raised, uh, addressing, addressing it, please. Uh, also just generally feeling like there's a lot of either or thinking going on in this group and talking going on in this group relating to the schedule and then uh, just in general, and then also around around the subcommittees. I'm not an expert on the Brown Act. Um, we'll let the lawyers deal with that, but this group could also just set its own standards and practices. So just because you could have a subcommittee that doesn't have to be Brown Act noticed, this group could still decide, well, we're still gonna publicize when these things are and have Zoom links for people to attend so they can still be open, right? Like you can, use common sense and be flexible and, and work within the confines of the law and have your own standards and practices that aren't just like, well, the law says this, so we're not gonna do all that, but we're not, right? So uh, that's it, thanks. Thank you, next speaker. Blair Beekman. Hi, thank you, uh, Blair Beekman here. I'd like to first thank uh, Landy up for asking for uh, if anyone wants to, uh, if that we should take a revote, that you should take a revote, and uh, to ask that question: Does anyone want to take a revote? It's an important question. I hope that you can uh, really consider uh, your revote, uh, your vote, and and that in the coming weeks you can change your vote and reconsider this issue. And uh, it's I think it's important to do that and 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 consider. The concepts of public oversight and 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 those good ideas and uh roland i felt roland's initial comments were really interesting on the subject and offered a good direction and it does take thought good luck with this um about uh you know i'm really sorry about my you know offering big words of my uh, my feeling that there's going to be a possible earthquake in the year 2023 and that you need to possibly you know make adjustments in how you're going to make your decision making uh, especially with uh, the election process and how that will work 
And I, I've got my information from looking over a com community energy um, uh, procurement reports, you know, because they work, you know, 10 years into the future and, and, and looking into those, it gives that sort of information that you can figure it out. I don't know how accurate it am, I am, but I feel it's fairly accurate. And it's with that that I, I really should note that the police, just, I mean, the city of San, uh, San Jose just gave their budget report and, and laid out, you know, they're at three times the level of uh, uh, police spending. Uh, from the, from a few years ago, they were at a three three times higher. That's not really celebrating reimagine very much, and so I think we're trying to address what reimagine can be with in health and and human services terms at this time and with upcoming natural disasters. How can you address things in the same way? If there are no other hands raised. Thank you. Then I'm going to uh, uh, adjourn us until our next meeting of the Charter Review Commission on June 14th, 2021. Thank you all. Good evening.